Ever wondered how to build Figma? A collaborative design tool with real-world and real-time features like cursors, chat, and common bubbles. Well, today's your chance to learn and build all of these features with me. Hi there, and welcome to a brand new project-based video that isn't just another CRUD app. Today, we'll build and deploy a Figma clone with live collaboration features like multi-cursors, cursor chat, and reactions active users, common bubbles, creating different shapes, uploading images, modifying properties to any value, freeform drawing, undo, redo, checking history, deleting, scaling, moving, clearing, exporting canvas, and much more. That's a lot, right? But the most important part is that all of this works in real time and the sessions are stored which means that anything you do here will also appear to whoever else is in the same file. We'll build this cool application using everyone's favorite Next14 and Tailwind CSS. Before we start coding, let me show you how the app works. Up in the top right, you'll see active users, who's here and what they're doing with their cursor. Unlike typical online whiteboards like Miro and FigJam, where you can create fixed specific shapes on click, and then modify the size by dragging it or change fewer to none properties like color, dimensions, and stroke without any proper user collaboration, our app is different. Just like Figma, we do all this, including creating different shapes like rectangles, circles, and triangles, and even adding text and uploading images with custom sizes by dragging your cursor with complete customization over color, dimensions, export, and for the artist in you, there's a free drawing mode where you can let your creativity flow. You might notice something on the left side. Every time I create an element, it pops up in the left sidebar. That's our real-time history or layers. Watch as I click this icon to clear the canvas and create something new to see how they stack up based on the shapes we create. Pretty cool, right? Now check this out. If I open up another browser, every move I make, creating, moving, or deleting, instantly shows on the right side. And yes, we've got the custom right-click menu and keyboard shortcuts too, like Control c and V for copy-pasting and Control z and Y to undo, redo, just like in our everyday developer routine. Now, if you want to collaborate with someone in real time, I can press forward slash or right-click to chat with them and say hi. To add some reactions, I can press the letter E or open the right-click menu and then click anywhere on the canvas, and everyone will know how I feel about their design. To make this application packed with even more useful features, we can use the comments icon inside the navbar to add a comment bubble similar to Figma for suggestions or to leave a happy note about the design. I can reply and even send emojis. If everything looks good, I can click on the right icon to mark this thread as complete. Exciting, isn't it? I'm sure I heard you say yes. All of this is possible thanks to LiveBlocks, the talk of the town bringing collaborative experiences to your apps in days and not months. It's so user-friendly that even Vercel utilized their features in their ship live stream. In this video, I'll teach you how to integrate live collaboration not just into this Figma clone project, but into any app you'll ever build. You don't have to learn any special framework or anything, but you will add an exciting technology to your skill resume. Now, you may wonder about the prerequisites for this tutorial. All you need is a good grasp of JavaScript and React, and if you don't have it yet, don't fret. Check out the crash courses on YouTube to get up to speed. Finally, if you want to dive deep into Next.js 14 and really understand how the internet works, while also learning by far the most used React framework, learning all the cutting edge features like server actions, routing, and server-side rendering, but also how to properly manage state in Next.js. Then check out our ultimate Next.js course, which I'll link in the description. 3000 developers have already joined and they love it. So if you're ready to get started, let's dive right into the code. To get started building our one-of-a-kind Figma clone, you can create a new empty folder on your desktop and drag and drop it into your empty Visual Studio Code window. That should leave you with something like this, where you can open up the terminal and we are ready to get started. And of course, we'll start 
by using the none other than the React framework for the web, Next.js. So go to nextjs.org and copy the installation command. Once you're back, simply paste it and add the dot slash at the end to initialize the repository right within our current folder. It'll prompt you to install the Next.js CLI to which you can say why, of course. And then it's gonna ask you a couple of questions to set our project up. First of all, are we gonna use TypeScript for this project? The answer is definitely yes. And you don't need to have any prerequisites of TypeScript to be able to follow along. I'm gonna teach you how to approach it from scratch. This time, we're gonna pair TypeScript with ESLint to follow all the best practices of building modern and scalable web applications. So say yes to that as well. Tailwind, of course, we're gonna say yes, as it almost became the default way of styling our Next.js applications. We don't need to use the source directory, but we will use the app router. And we don't need to customize the default import alias. And right away, the Next.js CLI will set up our starter Next.js application so we can dive right into the development. There we go. Everything has been installed successfully. So if we open up our file explorer, you can see that we have the app folder inside of which we have the layout and the page. Now, since we're building a Figma clone, we need a canvas on top of which we can do all the work. And there is a package called Fabric.js, which is an entire framework that makes it easy to work with the HTML5 canvas elements. It is essentially an interactive object model on top of canvas elements. It is designed for HTML5 canvas manipulation, allowing you to create and manipulate a lot of interactive graphical content on the website. Today, we'll explore one of the best Fabric.js use cases, which is implementing custom design tool. In this case, that's our Figma clone. So we can write npm install and get started with installing our first package or dependency called Fabric. Alongside Fabric, we'll also install a package called UUID, which is just a package that allows us to create unique IDs, which we'll need many of because each one of our elements in Figma has to have its own unique ID. But before we go ahead and install these packages, let me tell you a bit more about the second most important package which we'll use to make the building of our Figma clone possible. While Fabric will allow us to create a canvas and manipulate elements on it, a package called LiveBlocks will enable you to implement real-time collaboration features into any app you're building. As soon as you scroll down, you can immediately see what building blocks they give you for enabling collaboration within your apps. You have things like presence, where you can see what people are doing, broadcasting real-time events, adding comments for discussions on the website, even sharing and permission, documents, and more. And the best thing is, it integrates directly into our Next.js ecosystem. And the best of all is, in this single video, while you're building your own Figma clone, you'll learn how to implement most of LiveBlocks' features, such as the avatar stack, cursors, comments, and even our entire whiteboard feature built from scratch. So exciting stuff ahead. And best of all is that it's a developer-centric tool, which allows you to really easily use it within your code base and sync your application with other users. So to get started with using it, click the special link down in the description that will allow you to follow along and see exactly what I see. Then go to sign up, sign up with GitHub or Google, this will redirect you to your dashboard where you can see some starting information. In this case, I closed it because I'm gonna teach you everything and we can get started with creating a new project. Let's name our project Figma clone and we can choose the development environment for now. Immediately, you'll be able to track all of your users and some new items will appear on the left, such as rooms. Here, you'll be able to create rooms that people can use within your application as well as schemas, which allow you to define what kind of data you'll be storing in LiveBlocks. And the next thing we have to do is go to API keys and just copy the public key. This allows us to go back within our app and immediately create a new file 
cold.env.local where we can store our next underscore public underscore live blocks underscore public underscore key. There we go. And then simply paste it right here. Now we can proceed with the installation process. Liveblocks has super slick docs that allow you to get started off an example by choosing what kind of collaborative features you want to include within your app, such as whiteboard, comments, and more. In this case, of course, we're going to begin with a custom multiplayer experience. You can even choose a framework and you can get started right away. So let's copy these two additional packages, which we need to install and paste them within our command. So now we have npm install fabric, UUID, at liveblocks forward slash client, and at liveblocks forward slash react. I think that's going to be enough for now. So let's go ahead and press enter. The packages have installed and we can proceed. To move forward, we can just follow the steps from the docs. So here we need to initialize the liveblocks config.ts file. So let's copy this command, go back to our code, and just paste it right here. It's going to ask us if we want to install the create live block CLI. So let's say yes. And it's going to ask us a couple of questions. In this case, we do want to use react suspense hooks. We are using TypeScript and that's it. Hey, live blocks config TS file has been initialized and we can see it right here. It's asking us to add a couple of things such as our public API key. So we can do that first. For now, we can remove everything from the create client besides the public API key, uncomment it and set it to next underscore public underscore live blocks underscore public underscore key. And of course, this is coming from process.env. Now, just to satisfy TypeScript, we can add an exclamation mark at the end because it doesn't yet know if it's actually there or not. And with this, we have successfully created a Liveblocks client that now allows us to use it within a Liveblocks room. Liveblocks uses the concept of rooms, separating virtual spaces where people collaborate. And to create a real time experience, multiple users must be connected to the same room. When using Next.js, we recommend creating a room in a room.tsx file with the same directory as your current route. So that is the app room TSX. Let's copy this entire file, go back to code and create a new file within our app folder called room.tsx and paste what we copied from the docs. Now here it's trying to find liveblocks config, but I do believe we have to say dot dot slash to get to the correct path. And there we have it. We have our first room. Next, we have to use this room within our page. So we can use it within our homepage, which is just app page TSX. So let's copy this block of code. Now go to page TSX within the app folder and override everything that we currently have in there. We're simply importing a room from that slash room. And we're importing this collaborative app from the collaborative app. But the question is, what is the collaborative app? And it's essentially any feature that uses collaborative functionalities. So in this case, we can use the live blocks hook that figures out if there are any other users with us in a room right now called use others. So let's copy it and then create a new file called collaborative app. I'm just going to copy the title to ensure I spelled it correctly. Go here and create it within the app. Finally, copy the code and paste it right here. Once again, we're going to modify the config to come from the root of the directory. So now within the page, we are referring to our collaborative app, which is coming from the same directory. So I believe it should get it correctly. If I say dot slash collaborative app dot TSX, and if I start typing TSX and remove it, looks like now IntelliSense figures out that we actually do have a component there and it no longer complains. So now let's see what is the next step. If you look at the next steps, you can see that by default, Liveblocks is configured to work without an authentication endpoint where everyone automatically has access to room. We're going to use this approach for prototyping and our entire Figma clone. So with that said, we have now set up the foundation to start our collaborative Figma experience. So going back to our app, the only thing we have to do is clear our terminal 
and run npm run dev to, for the first time ever, start our application on localhost 3000. Hold Ctrl or Command and click the link. You'll see a quick loading and then immediately after a piece of text that says there are zero other users online. That's because only we are online. But what happens if I split this view and try to open up localhost 3000 in another tab? Once I do that, you can see that there is one other users online as well. And if I try it once again, you'll see that now there are two users, three users, and so on. You get the point, our live functionalities are working. So now is the time that we start developing the primary features of our Figma application, and then continue building collaborative functionalities on top of them. So I closed all the other tabs so that we only have one, and that means that we can get started with developing our application. But before we proceed, there's just a tiny bit of setup that we have to do to make our further development experience much easier. So one thing that we definitely have to do is install and set up ShadCN, which is going to be our UI library. You can visit ui.shadcn.com and click get started. Then navigate to installation and choose Next.js. Here, it's going to give you step-by-step -step instruction, and we can skip step one because we have already initialized our Next.js application. So we just have to run the ShadCN UI CLI to set up our project. So let's copy it, open up a new terminal, and then paste it right here. MPX ShadCN UI, add latest, init. We can choose the style we'd like to use here, and we're going to go with default. We can use slate. We will use CSS variables. And just like that, the majority of the project setup is automatically done. Now, alongside ChatCN, we also have Tailwind CSS installed here. And Tailwind CSS has its own specific config, where ChatCN overrode the theme to provide some specific colors. In this case, we want to override that config to our custom Figma theme. So in the readme down below, you can find and copy the full Tailwind config file and then simply override this one right here. Alongside with the Tailwind config, we'll also have to update our globals.css file. So in the same readme, copy the code and paste it right here. You'll hear me mention the readme file many times throughout this video. And that's because I want us to focus on what matters implementing the canvas and collaboration functionalities rather than focusing on implementing CSS or styling. I want to teach you how to do the stuff that truly matters. So now let's go back to our app. Let's remove this collaborative app experience because we just use that to test it out. Go back to our page DSX and here within our room, let's simply render an H1 and we can give it a class name of something like font dash XL. And just before we check out our app, let me show you one thing. And that is that within the globals, we're using some special styles from LiveBlocks, and we have to install that to be able to use it. So simply copy this part, run npm install, and then install at LiveBlocks react comments. We're going to use it later on to implement the live comments functionality. But for now, we're going to simply use their styles. Once that is installed, we can go back to our localhost 3000. And there we go, we have our huge title, meaning that ShadCN and Tailwind CSS works as well. And while we're doing this setup, why don't we focus on fixing up the favicon, which is this little icon that you can see to the left of your tab, and the title as well. Next.js makes it so easy. So let's go to our file explorer and go to layout.tsx. Inside of here, we're exporting the metadata. So we can give it a title of Figma clone, and we can give it a description of something like a minimalist Figma clone using fabric.js and live blocks for real time collaboration. There we go. That's looking good. Keep in mind inside of here, we're importing a global CSS. And instead of using the inter font, we can use the work underscore sans font. And we need to modify it right here by saying work sans. 
is gonna be equal to a call of work underscore sans. And we can expand it a bit by using the Latin subset and also a variable of dash dash font dash work dash sans. So it's gonna be activated once we use that class. We can also get specific weights by saying weight is an array of 400 as well as 600. And we can also get a bold of 700. Now scrolling down, we can use this font right here within the body. That's gonna be work sans, that class name. And we can also further style our class name by modifying the border color. So let's make this a template string where we call the work sans as a variable and then also provide a string of BG primary gray 200. And here's a key part. We won't be using the room just within the page anymore. We'll actually be using it within the layout. So right here where we have the body, we can wrap our children with the room. So we can call it a room coming from that slash room where we put the children right inside it. Now we can go back to the page and we can remove the room from here as we're using it within the layout. That's gonna leave us with an empty slate where we have just an H1. And we can also change the color by saying text dash white as now we have a dark background. And before we check out our live website, let's also modify the favicon and gather all the necessary assets we'll need throughout the build of this project. And to get those assets, go to the description of this video, find the readme within it, find the zipped assets folder, download it, unzip it, and then simply drag and drop it to the root of our directory. It's gonna ask you whether you want to add it or copy it, simply say copy, and you'll notice that now we have this new assets folder within our directory. Now the assets contains a couple of folders we already have, such as the public, as well as the lib folder. So delete both of those folders from the root of our directory. And then we can simply drag and drop all of these folders to the root of our directory. Constants, we're gonna repeat the process with our lib. Make sure to delete the old one first. There we go. Lib as well. We have public. And finally, we have types. The last thing we have right here is gonna be the favicon. So delete the old one and then drag and drop the new one into the app folder and delete all of the assets that I provided. Now, it might seem like there's a lot of files and folders right here, but don't worry. The only reason why I provided all of these to you is if either they are just some static code, as you can see right here, we're exporting some colors, some shapes with their icons, names, and values, nothing logic related, all just simple values. Or if it's being picked from somewhere else, like this hook right here, use interval from Dan Abramov's blog, we just copy and pasted that. Or if I wanted to really document everything for you. So in this case, we have something like use max z index, which is a utility function. And I went ahead and provided thorough comments on exactly what this function does. So we can explore it in more detail later on. There's also this canvas file that does all the logic related to the canvas. Here, I provided in-depth comments on literally everything that is happening. And we're gonna go through it later on once we consume some of the parts of this larger file. So more on that soon. But for now, we have everything we need within our app, we have our favicon, so let's check how our current app looks like. We have the same old title and dark background as before, but now it says Figma clone and we have the Figma favicon right here, which means that now we have everything we need to get started with developing it. I'm gonna put my browser side by side by our editor so we can see the changes that we make live. There we go, that's better. While we're working on this, I wanna ensure that this text is nicely centered. So I'm gonna go back to app, and then page, and here we can nicely center this H1 by putting it within a div, and that div will have a class name equal to h-full, w-full, flex, justify content of center, and items center as well. And to fully center it, I think we'll need to change this to height of 100 VH. There we go. 
and also give it a text center as well alongside item center. And maybe we'll make it just a tiny bit smaller like 2XL. There we go, that's looking great. Now, before we implement the actual canvas and turn this into a real Figma board, first, I wanna teach you how to add live collaborative functionalities to any app, and then we're gonna upgrade them to match our Figma. And the first feature we'll start implementing is called Live Cursors. It allows us to very quickly figure out if somebody else is in our app right now and what exactly they're doing. So these two boxes present two different sessions within the same room. And you can see the only thing you have to do is move your cursor and in real time in the other browsers, you'll be able to see exactly what the other person does, exactly like it is in real Figma. To make that happen, first we have to create our live environment by going to or creating the components folder in the root of our directory and creating a new file called live.tsx. Here, we can run RAFCE, which will immediately create just a basic React arrow function component. Within here, we can do a quick setup. And by implementing the setup, I simply mean calling those live cursors component, which we also have to create. So let's create a new folder within the components folder called cursor. Within the cursor, we can create three additional files. Cursor tsx, which is a singular cursor that you can see on the screen, where you can also run RAFCE just to quickly get us started. We can then create another component called live cursors. tsx, which is going to be a collection of all cursors showing up live on the screen. And finally, we can create something known as a cursor chat tsx, where you can also run RAFCE, and we're gonna see that in action very soon. But for now, let's focus just on consuming the live cursor within the live component. Our live component is going to be like a collection of all of the live functionalities we'll implement. Live cursors, cursor chat, reactions, and more. So let's simply call the live cursors right here as a self-closing component. And if we actually run RAFCE within live cursors, we'll also be able to automatically import it. I did that by pressing Control or Command Space to give me this auto import possibility. Now we can figure out what live functionalities we need within Live to then be able to pass it to Live cursors. And the first thing we need is something called Others. So we can say const Others is equal to use Others coming from add Live Blocks Config, like this. It is a simple hook. And this hooks, remember we used it before in the demo example, it returns the list of all the other users in the room. We can also quickly see what's happening within their docs where it says that it extracts data from the list of other users currently in the same room. So it's not just showing the number of users, it also extracts data from them. And in this case, we'll need the data about the positioning of their cursor. So now we can pass others into live cursors has others as a simple prop. You can see TypeScript complaining already, saying that it's not accepting it, but now we can move into live cursors and accept it as our first prop of the day. Others is equal to, and we can say live cursor props coming from at types forward slash type, like so. This is a predefined type that we have created before where I simply spend some time figuring out exactly which type it has to be. In this case, it is others, which is a read-only property of user, presence, and base user metadata. If you don't specify it, I believe it will be specified either by TypeScript automatically. If I didn't write it like here, I believe it would have been specified by the LiveBlocks team itself because it's gonna figure out the result is coming directly from this use others hook. So now that we have the others, the question is how to use them. Well, first, we can map over them and show a cursor for each new user. So instead of returning something automatically here, rather, we're going to say others.map by mapping over every other person. So we can say other, and then for each one of these other people, we're gonna open up a new block like this. Instead of simply getting other, we can destructure some of the property. So we can destructure the connection ID as well as presence. 
which will give us some additional information, such as their cursor position. So now that we're mapping over them, first we can check if there is no presence, in which case we can simply return or exit out of the function by returning null. If we do have the presence on the other hand, we can return something else. Return a new cursor. And this is the cursor component we have created not that long ago, which looks like this. So we simply call it cursor coming from that slash cursor. And of course, since we're mapping over it, we also need to provide it a key, which is going to be a connection ID, because one connection ID is paired with every single cursor or the user that joins our app. Now to this cursor, we'll also have to pass some additional properties, such as the color of that cursor. And in this case, I've made some predefined colors, which you can get by saying colors, all uppercase, and you can import them from add forward slash constants. If you go into it, you're going to notice that this is simply an array of a few colors. Then we can randomize it by accessing a specific property using the square brackets notation, and then choosing a number with a connection ID, and then using a modular operator and saying colors dot length. This is going to pick up a random color based off of the connection ID. We can also give it the X position by saying presence dot cursor dot X, as well as Y by saying presence that cursor dot Y. And then also a message in case we are typing something by saying presence dot message. These are all the necessary properties that we need to pass to now actually show our cursor on the screen. We need to know the position on the X axis and the position on the Y axis to be able to cover this 2D plane. So moving into our individual cursor, we can now accept some props. We can accept the color, the X, the Y, and the message, and say that all of these are equal to type of props. So at the top, we can define these props by saying type props is equal to, and we can give it a color of a type string X of a type number, Y of a type number. And now let's turn this text that just says cursor into an actual cursor. We can do that by giving this div a class name equal to pointer dash events dash none. And if sometimes you're not sure what a specific Tailwind class does, simply hover over it and you can see the full info. And if this didn't show up for you, just go to extensions, search for Tailwind CSS IntelliSense, and you should be able to install this package, Tailwind CSS IntelliSense, and then it will show up. Now, next to this one, we also want to give it a position absolute and top zero, as well as left zero. So first we want to reset its position to be able to dynamically modify it using the style property. So we can say style of transform, and then we want to use the dynamic template string to call the translate X property and translate it by X pixels to the X axis like this, and also provide the translate Y property. And we want to translate it by Y pixels on the Y axis. Now, if we save it, nothing's going to show up yet, but we're working towards something. And that something is just an SVG image that changes colors that acts like the cursor that you can see on the screen right now, but it's going to be the cursor from the other people. And I already gave you access to that cursor under assets. So if you simply start typing cursor SVG, you'll be able to see that it's coming from public assets cursor SVG. And we can just self close it like this and provided a prop of color is equal to color. Now later on, we're going to also implement the message part of this component where a cursor can actually display a message. But for now, we just need to be able to see it on the screen. So now if we open up another browser and go to localhost 3000, like I have done right here, we hopefully should be able to see something happening, but not yet. Nothing is happening. I believe that's because we haven't even used or called the live component anywhere. So of course it's not going to show. But before that, we have to resolve this TypeScript issue with the live cursors and the way we're calling them. And the reason we're seeing this is because TypeScript is saving our ass. If we go into this file, there's one small mistake that we've made that is incredibly hard to notice. 
and that is that this component is not actually returning anything. If you think about it, we're just opening a function block right here and defining some kind of a map, but we're never doing anything with that map. So what we have to do is we have to return the output of the map for this component to work at all. So now if we do that, you can see that this is no longer complaining. And finally, we can go back to our original homepage, which is within the app and then page. And here, right below the H1, we can call our live component, which has the live cursors implemented. So we can import it from components live. Now, the reason we're having this error is because LiveBlocks is having trouble creating the room context. As context is a React and therefore browser feature, we cannot call it in the server. And if you know something about Next.js, you know that by default, all pages are server-side rendered. So since we'll be using LiveBlocks as well as Canvas, most of these things will be client-side rendered. So we can just say use client right here at the top. If we save it, you can see that now it goes away. But now we have another issue saying that it cannot read properties of undefined reading X here referring to the cursor, which means that the cursor is undefined, which we definitely don't want. So let's go to live, live cursors. And here, alongside giving the check for the presence, if the presence exists, we also can ensure that the cursor also exists by saying if no presence dot or rather question mark dot cursor. That way will only show the cursor if the cursor information exists. With that, the error is gone. And what we need to do before we can see the other cursor is update the presence of all of those cursors. And we can do that by moving to the live.tsx file. This is the file that will handle absolutely everything that has to do something with live blocks functionality. So in this case, we're going to use a second hook of the day, const this structure, and then that's going to be equal to use my presence. And that's coming from LiveBlocks config. Now this use my presence, if you hover over it, again, this is very useful with a lot of different types of libraries and packages, especially if they're well documented. As soon as you hover over it, you see what you need to pass to it, you see what it returns back right here, the presence of the current user of the current room and the function to update it. And here you can update the X and Y axis to know exactly where the cursor is. So we definitely need to know where we are. First, we get my presence and update my presence like this. And then from my presence, we can just destructure the cursor information like so. And then we can leave update my presence as it is. And we can also define the type for this one as any right here. I promise we won't be using many any's throughout this video, but this is just one of those situations. Now that we have our cursor and update my presence, we can put it to use. So we'll create three separate functions. They'll be called const handle pointer move, which is going to be equal to an arrow function. This arrow function will also be a call to the use callback hook like this coming directly from react. So we can just wrap it in a use callback like so, and then we can provide an empty dependency array. The way that the use callback works, of course, if you import it from react is that it doesn't recreate this function every time. It just takes this one instance of the function and then provides the outputs. You can also hover over it to see more information. It will return a memoized version of the callback that only changes if one of the inputs change. So now this use callback function is going to accept an event. So we can say event of a type react dot pointer event. And immediately we want to prevent the default behavior. So we can say event dot prevent default. And then we have to get the current cursor position. We can do that by saying const x is equal to event dot client x minus event dot current target dot get bounding client rect and we call it as a function that's supposed to be bounding right here and then we need to say dot x so what the second part of the equation is doing is it's getting the width of the actual cursor so we subtract the x position of the cursor 
to the actual position on the screen. That's to get even more precise position. And we can do absolutely the same thing for the Y. So const Y is equal to event.client Y minus event.target.getBoundingClientRect.Y. After we have those, we can call the update my presence coming from the hook that we have used before. We pass in an object to which we pass the cursor and then we pass the X and Y values. And this is the handle pointer move. Now I've told you that we're going to have two similar functions like this one. And the second one is the handle pointer leave. So we can duplicate this function below handle pointer move and rename it to handle pointer leave. So this hides the cursor once we leave the screen. In this case, we don't need to get any calculations. The only thing we have to do is update my presence to cursor is going to be set to null. And then message is also going to be set to null. That's going to be used for later on for once we implement cursor chat. And finally, once we come back to the canvas, we want to do something similar as what we do on the handle pointer move. So we can duplicate handle pointer move one more time below and rename it to handle pointer down. In this case, we don't need event prevent default, we get the positions, and then we update my presence, same thing as before. Now we need to make use of all of these three functions by adding the handlers on our div or rather the listeners. So we can create a listener called on pointer move, which is going to be equal to handle pointer move. And you can guess it, we need to do the same for the other two as well. So that's going to be on pointer leave once we leave the screen, as well as on pointer down once we come back to the screen. So now our div is listening for all of these changes. And once we enter with our cursor, it should track the current cursor position. And if we test it out, it does appear like it's not tracking it, but I can assure you it is, but it's just that this div has to cover the entire screen. And right now, if we give it a class name and do something like a border five and border green 500, so we can see where this div is, you can see that it's nowhere to be found. We cannot even see it. And we thought that it's wrapping our entire thing. So what we have to do instead, is move these classes right here from our original div onto our new div that is within the live because we want to make our entire screen live. So copy all the classes from here from page and move them over to the class name of live to this div right here. Of course, without the class name right here. There we go. Save it. Of course, only after you fix the errors right here and also move this h1 from the page to the live because we want to ensure that it is within our live environment. There we go. So now it's in the center right here, but I still cannot see my border. Maybe that's because I should have said border two. There we go. Border five is not a valid tail and property. So now you can see that we are wrapping our entire screen within this live environment within which we're tracking the position of the cursor. So now let's remove this border because we know it's there, fix the styles. And let's open up the second browser. And would you look at that? As soon as you hover over one screen right here, the cursor moves nicely on the second as well. This is great. We can see exactly what the other person is doing on our screen. Or can we, we can just see where they're moving. But right now, there's not a lot of functionality for us to communicate with them or for them to do anything on the screen at all. We just have a single piece of text. So the first thing we can do is make these two cursors across two different devices actually communicate. And we'll do that using LiveBlocks' cursor chat. The live cursor chat functionality will allow us to communicate with the other cursor you've been seeing on the screen. If you press the forward slash, a new cursor chat appears. And as soon as you start typing like, hi, you can see that it appears instantly in real time on the other screen. So let's go ahead and give some special powers to our cursor as well. Within our application, we can move to the live cursors, and then we can move to the cursor. Remember, here, we left some space for the message. 
But not only that, we have also already created a new component called cursor chat. So within this cursor chat, we'll be able to implement that input that you have seen that allows us to type in the message. But before we do that, we have to go back to our primary live component called live.tsx to first call that cursor chat. So right here above the live cursor, we can check if the cursor exists like this. Remember, this is the same cursor coming from our hook call right here at the top cursor coming from use my presence. I'm going to also toggle down these three functions. So it's easier to see. And here we can call our cursor chat. We can call it in a way as we would call a simple component, self-closing call to the cursor chat component, and we can immediately import it. We now need to pass it some information such as the cursor itself by saying cursor is equal to cursor. And we also need to pass it something known as a cursor state. So right here at the top, we can define a new state. Use state snippet like this is called cursor state and set cursor state at the start equal to an object that has the property of mode. And here we can get the cursor mode coming from types type dot hidden like this. So first at the start, we're setting the state or the mode of the state to cursor state hidden. And this is simply coming from our types where we defined an enum, which is just a possibility of a couple of different strings, such as hidden chat reaction selector or reaction. And these are all the different predefined values of which our state can be. We also have to import use state from react. And now we have this new state. This will help us track the state of the cursor. Are we simply pointing? Do we have maybe a reaction selector? We'll see that soon. Or are we chatting? And we can also update it within our handlers. So on handle pointer leave, we can remove this event prevent default as we don't need it. And we can set cursor state to be equal to mode cursor dot hidden because we're hiding it. And this is the only thing that the pointer leave does. And we don't need to modify the other two for now. But now that we have this cursor state, we can pass it to the cursor chat. So we can say cursor state is equal to cursor state, as well as set cursor state is equal to set cursor state. And we can also pass in the update my presence is equal to update my presence. Now that we're passing all of these, let's go into the cursor chat and let's make use of them. Here, we can immediately and happily accept the information about the cursor as well as the cursor state. And of course, let's not forget about the set cursor state and update my presence. And that's going to be of a type cursor chat props coming from types. Great. Now let's start creating the layout of our cursor chat. We're going to start with a div that's going to have a class name equal to absolute because we need to match it with the position of the cursor top zero and left zero at the start. But then using the style property as before, we're going to modify the transform properties of that div by giving it a template string of translate X and a value of cursor dot X and move it by X pixels. So we can do PX and also translate Y which is going to be having a value of cursor dot Y and also specify the pixel value. Now we won't be able to see this yet in the browser, but we will be able to see as soon as soon as we check for the cursor state, we can say if cursor state dot mode is triple equal to cursor mode coming from types dot chat. So if we're chatting, then display the following empty react fragment like this. We can also wrap it in parentheses. So it's easier to see where the new component begins. There we go. That is great. Now within this cursor chat, we can also render the cursor SVG, which we have rendered before and automatically imported. And to it, we can pass a color of hash 000. So that's a black color. Below that, we need to create a div that's going to be used for our bubble form. So we can create a div 
and that div will have a class name equal to position absolute left to top five, BG blue of 500, padding X of four, padding Y of two, text dash SM for small, leading dash relaxed, which is gonna modify the line height and text dash white so we can actually see the color within that div. And finally, we can make it a bit rounded by giving it a rounded dash in square brackets, 20 pixels. Great. Now within it, we need to figure out if there is a message in there. So if there's a previous message, we can check that like this. Cursor state dot previous message and end, then we're gonna render a div and that div will simply render a previous message. So here we can say cursor state dot previous message. So only if we have typed something before, we wanna show it before we show the input to enter a new message. And this input will also have a couple of class names. Now, we're not gonna go ahead and build this entire thing without actually seeing what we're building, right? So for now, we can put this cursor mode chat check right here, all the way to the top. And don't forget it's closing statement too, like this. We're gonna comment that part out for now because this will allow us to actually see what we're creating. As soon as you hover, you'll be able to see our cursor chat appear right there. Great, so now that we can see it, let's proceed with styling this input. We can give it a class name equal to Z10 to appear on top, W of 60 for width, border none, BG transparent, text dash white, placeholder dash blue dash 300, and as we do with many inputs, outline of none. If we do it, now it's gonna look much better. We cannot even see that it is an input. Let's also give it an out of focus of true, because as soon as it appears on the screen, we wanna start typing. There we go, that's already much better. Now, we also wanna modify its states. We wanna figure out how to modify the value. So for that reason, we can create two functions at the top within this function. The first function will be called const handle change. Just a typical function that we do often in React that accepts E as an event, which is a react.change event, specifically of a type HTML5 input element. That's one function. And the other function is const handle key down. Here we'll have to also get the event, which is in this case of a type react.keyboard event of HTML5 input element. And here we'll have to monitor for the enter key in case we wanna submit our message. But now that we have the skeletons of these two functions, we can pass them to our input. We can say that the onChange value will be calling the handle change property like this or the function and the on key down will be calling the handle key down function looks like we misspelled it right here there we go we can also give it a placeholder where we can check if a previous message exists by saying cursor state dot previous message if it exists then the placeholder will be an empty string else the placeholder will be type a message. Great. Finally, every input needs to have a value, which is going to be cursor state dot message, and we can give it a max length of about 50. Now to test it out, we can just hover over here and we can immediately see the great form that we have created. But of course, we have to put it to use. So right now we're seeing it only on our screen and we're seeing it always but we only want to see it when its state is activated. So soon enough, we're going to bring back that if statement or the ternary operation that we had not that long ago. But for now, let's focus on updating our empty functions. The handle change function has to update our presence by adding a message to it. So we can say update my presence where message is equal to e.target.value. 
the value contains, of course, the value that we typed. And also, we have to modify the cursor state like this. Set cursor state, we call it and set it to an object where the mode of the cursor state is cursor mode.chat because we're chatting. We can also reset the previous message by saying previous message is null and then provide a new message by saying e.target.value. Now we're handling the change. And we also can handle the key down by setting the cursor state to also be the mode of cursor chat. So we can do it like that. Mode is cursor chat or cursor mode that chat. And here we're going to set the previous message to be equal to cursor state dot message. So essentially we are setting what was previously the new message to the previous message. And then we are resetting the message right here. Soon enough, it will make sense why we're doing this. But essentially, it allows you to type something, press enter, and then get more real estate to type something else. And of course, we only want to create more screen real estate for typing once we press enter. That's exactly how it is on real Figma. So we can say if e dot key is triple equal to the enter key, only then we do what we have done right now by moving this cursor state within that if. And we can also have an else if where we can check if the e dot key is escape. In that case, we can just set the cursor mode to hidden. There we go. That's much better. Finally, you can see that our TypeScript is complaining a lot here saying that we maybe don't have access to this cursor state. So it's finally the time that we put this over within a ternary operator that we previously removed. So let's take this line right here above this empty fragment. So we can call it like this, remove the comment, indent it properly, and then end it right here after the React fragment. There we go. So now it's no longer complaining because it knows that the cursor mode has to exist and it has to be chat. So as you can see, now we cannot really see anything. So that means that we have to find a way to actually activate the cursor chat mode. And if you remember in the demo that I've showed you, that was just the forward slash key that would activate it. But in this case, it's not really doing anything. So let's go ahead and make it happen. And to do that, we can go back to our live component where we're doing literally everything regarding to the live. And right here, we need to add a use effect to keep track of our keyboard events that's going to listen to our forward slash key. So we can open up a regular use effect with an empty dependency array. And we can, of course, import it from React. Within this use effect, we can create a new function. Const on key up, which is once we press up the key, which is again going to be equal to a keyboard event like this. And also const on key down, where we're going to also do the same thing, keyboard event. So here, we want to figure out if the key is forward slash. So what we can do on the on key up is say if e dot key is triple equal to forward slash. In that case, we can set cursor state to be equal to an object where the mode is cursor mode dot chat previous message is null and message is an empty string. We can also modify the else if e dot key is triple equal to escape like this. In that case, we can update my presence, where we're going to reset the message to be equal to an empty string. Let's not forget to also set the cursor state to be equal to mode of cursor mode dot hidden. And finally, on key down, we also want to have one if, where if e dot key is triple equal to forward slash, like this, then we want to call the e dot prevent default to prevent the default browser behavior. Then since we're using the update my presence, we can add it right here to our dependency array of the use effect. And we can put our event listeners to use by saying window that add event listener key up is going to call the on key up key down is going to call the on key down. And since we're being good react developers, we also have to return to remove those event listeners like so. 
So now if we save this, React should be listening for our events. And if we go here and type forward slash, you can see that type a message appears and we can actually start typing. Now I do think that I'm zoomed in a bit, so it appears like a very big thing, but there we go, this is more like it. Now it's of the proper size and we can actually start typing. The only question is, will the other user be able to see this chat as well? And if we try it out, the answer is no, it doesn't seem to be appearing on the other cursor. So why is that? Well, let's go to our other cursor where we're rendering it, which is going to be under live cursors and then cursor. And would you look at that? We gave ourselves a little to do to do later on before, and now is the time to actually implement it. So now we actually have access to the message belonging to this cursor, not just the cursor position as we had it before. And we can check if message exists. And in that case, we can render a div and that div will render a P tag that's gonna render the message. So now if we save this and try it once again, you can see a little test, although it's very dark. Let me make it a bit lighter for you by giving this P tag a class name of text-white. So now if we type test, you can see it actually appears in real time on the right side. But of course, let's make it look a bit better by styling this div right here and giving it a class name equal to absolute. Left of two to just move it a bit away from where we are top of five, that's gonna look like this, rounded dash three XL, padding X of four and padding Y of two. Let's also modify the background color to be the color of the other user's cursor. That's exciting. So we can give it a style property where we modify the background color to be equal to the color we have from their cursor. And we can style the P tag by giving it a white space like this, white space, all one word, no wrap, and text dash SM and leading dash relaxed. That's gonna change the line height. Now, if we do this and save, if we try typing something, you can see that it appears within the bubble of the same color of the cursor. So we can say, hi there, I'm building Figma and then they're saying the same thing, or maybe the other person can now go here and say, hi, I am building it too. And you can see it appears in the red color. This is wonderful. So now we're not only tracking the position of the other person that's currently within our app, we are also able to communicate with them. And all of this is amazing, immediately done by using the live cursor chat functionality, but we're gonna take it a step further and also implement reactions. Reactions are a really cool thing that allows you to press the letter E and then immediately express your thoughts. Maybe you're looking at a very well-designed design that allows you to very easily create your website, in which case you would do something like this. That looks great. Or maybe somebody created a 3D madness that's so hard to develop, in which case you would just spam sad faces because it would be hard to develop. In any case, you can also escape that emoji or say this is good because now we have the chat functionality too. But with that said, let's go ahead and implement reactions. To start implementing reactions, we can for now close all of the files we currently have opened. I usually do that by holding command and then pressing W, or you can just close them manually. We can then go to our components folder and create a new folder within components called reaction. Within reaction, you can create a new file called the reaction button.tsx and run RAFCE. Also within reaction called flying reaction.tsx. And there we can also run RAFCE. Let's go ahead and get started with the reaction button. This reaction button is exactly what you're seeing right here. A selector in a sense that allows us to choose which kind of emoji or reaction we want to take. So we're going to have a button for each one of these selections. 
this reaction button and flying reactions are all already provided to us by live blocks in their example. So let's take first the reaction selector. And you can see here, essentially, it's just a selection of reaction buttons. So what we can do is copy their entire example. And I'm basically just at the live cursors chat example on the live blocks documentation. You can easily find it just by Googling live cursors chat example, then simply copy it. And in our case, we can paste it right within the reaction button component by overriding everything and then pasting what we have. This brought in both the reaction button as well as the reaction selector, which we're exporting from this file. And let's also not forget about the flying reaction, which we can get from here, which we can completely copy, go back to the code and override our flying reaction too. One thing that we must not forget is that there's also a flying reaction module CSS, which you can also copy, go back to our code and create a new file called index.module.css and paste that file that we copied. These are just some additional animations for our emojis. And since we called it index module, we can go here and just modify the name to index.module.css. Now let's put our reaction selectors as well as our flying reactions to the test. Can you guess where we'll be doing that? It's going to be where we use all of the live functionalities within our live.tsx component. So right here below calling the cursor, we can check if the cursor state dot mode is triple equal to cursor mode dot reaction selector. If it is, then we want to render our reaction selector component automatically imported from the reaction button. And of course, we also have to pass the set function to it, which we have to define at the top. So let's go all the way up right here and define a new state by using the use state snippet, which is going to be called reactions. Also set reactions at the start equal to an empty array. And we can further define the type by saying this is of a type reaction coming from types and specifically an array of reactions. So that's going to look like this. Now that we have this state, we can pass it over to our reaction selector by saying set reaction is equal to a function call where we get a reaction and then we call a function set reaction to which we pass the reaction like so. We're going to worry about the TypeScript errors or warnings later on. For now, I think we're good. We just want to ensure to see the reaction selector on our screen. So let's remove this and let's try to figure out how to turn on our reaction selector. I think this will have to do with our use effect where we're listening for all of these changes. Right now here, we're listening for the forward slash event and the escape event, but we trigger reactions on the letter E. So we can add an additional else if statement and check if E dot key is triple equal to the letter E. And then we can open up a new block of code and say set cursor state to which we can pass the mode of cursor mode dot reaction selector. So now we know exactly when to turn this mode on. Let's also see if there is something we have to do with our other functions like handle pointer move, leave or down. First, let's look into the handle pointer move. In here, we'll have to add an additional if statement to check if the cursor is not in the reaction selector, then we have to update the cursor position. So we can say if cursor is equal to null, or if cursor state dot mode is not equal to the cursor mode dot reaction selector. In that case, we can do all of the calculations we have been doing so far, but not if we are within the reaction selector, because then the reactions are going to be sticked to the bottom of the screen and we don't care about the cursor position. That's it for the handle pointer move. Finally, in the handle pointer down, we'll also have to check out if we are currently in the reaction state. 
So right here below update my presence, we can set the cursor state. And the reason why we're doing this is to check if we are in the reaction mode, then we want to set a special property called is pressed to true. And here we need to get access to the previous state. So we can do that with a callback function similar to what we do in react hooks. So we call it like this state of type cursor state like this. And then here, we can say cursor state dot mode is triple equal to cursor mode dot reaction. So we're checking if it is. And if it is, we will spread the entire state and set the is pressed value to true, else we'll simply spread the state. And then we have to close it properly. Let's just see what we're doing here. Set cursor state, we're closing this one. We also need to be closing this one right here. And what am I missing? I think I was missing one extra parenthesis. Yeah, it should be like this. Set cursor state, we have a callback function like this. We check for the reaction, we spread the necessary state, or we just leave it as it is. We'll soon come back to fix those TypeScript issues. But for now, let's see what's happening. We're updating our state. And we also have to do a similar thing on the handle pointer up. So this is yet another handler we'll create. Const handle pointer up is equal to everything is the same use callback with react pointer event like this. And of course, since we're using the use callback, we have to properly add the dependency array as well. And within it, we can do the same thing. State is the cursor state. And then we simply return it like this. We add this special is press property in case we're dealing with the reaction state. And we can now add this handle pointer up to our div listeners on pointer up and then handle pointer up. Great. And we must also not forget to pass the additional properties to the dependency array of the use callback hook. In this case, we want to make it recalculate the output whenever the cursor state dot mode changes, or when the set cursor state function changes. And that is the same for the handle pointer down, as well as the handle pointer up. There we go. So now we have uh, done it properly. We're still having some issues with TypeScript right here. So let's see if we can fix it. If we scroll all the way up to where we're defining the cursor state, which is right here, we haven't really given it a proper type coming from live blocks. So what we can do right here is define the type of the state property by giving it a cursor state type like this and save it. If we do this, you'll notice that no longer we have any issues because now TypeScript knows exactly what this state is made up of. So now we can collapse all of these code blocks. So it's easier to see. And we're passing all of the necessary handlers to our listeners on the div. And we're rendering this reaction selector. Now within this reaction selector, you can see that we also have a TypeScript type warning, which is also saving us once again. Instead of just setting the state of reaction, which is what we're doing here right now, I want to do something else. And that is call a set cursor state. So that's exactly what we'll be doing, modifying the mode to be equal to cursor mode dot reaction, because that's what we're trying to do modify the reaction, we want to give the reaction itself right here. So reaction is equal to reaction coming from the state. And we're going to set the is pressed to false, it looks like I've put a dot instead of a comma right here, which automatically fixes it. So now that's good. But to make a further optimization as well, I want to wrap this into a use callback hook. In applications such as Figma, and especially tracking cursors, elements moving across the screen, we want to ensure that we are very optimized, because we can have many cursors moving around the screen. And one mistake of recreating this function every time could be very costly. So what we can do is copy this block of code, put it right here above, and call it within a const set reactions function that is a use callback that accepts the reaction we pass into it of a type string. 
and then returns a code block that has an empty dependency array. Within here, we can call the set cursor state. And now we can simply call the set reactions within this call right here. There we go. That makes much more sense. And it's also using the use callback. So now we can go into the reaction selector and check if we have done everything correctly and maybe make some small modifications to the code that we copied from live blocks. First of all, we don't want to use any box shadows or transitions right here. We want to ensure that our emojis appear on the bottom. So we can completely restyle this div by giving it a class name equal to absolute bottom of 20, left of zero, right of zero, giving a margin X of auto, W fit, transform, rounded dash full, BG dash white, and padding X of two. Now, if we save it, go back to the website and press the letter E, you can see how nicely these emojis appear in the bottom. And once we click on them, it goes away. So that part is now looking great. But of course, we're not yet seeing the actual animation. So let's figure out how to do it. Our reaction button file is done. But now we have to focus on the flying reaction, because that's where we can see all of those flying animations. And this file is as good as it can be because we copied it directly from live blocks examples. So now let's go into our live where we're recalling this reaction selector. And let's call the flying reaction as well. We can do it right here on top below this h1 by mapping over our reaction. So we can say reaction dot map, where we get each individual reaction. And then we render a flying reaction for each one. Just to make sure that we can differentiate the reaction from this one, we can call this R. And then we can give it a key equal to something like R dot timestamp dot to string, because each reaction has a timestamp, we need to give it the x position, such as the r dot point dot x, as well as y, which is r dot point dot y, we can give it a timestamp, which is equal to r dot timestamp, and a value which is equal to r dot value. And of course, we have to import the flying reaction. So let's see how we have called it flying reaction export default. That looks good to me. But I misspelled it, it's supposed to be flying. There we go. So now we can automatically import it from our reaction folder. And how nicely TypeScript lets us know that we have made a mistake, that's supposed to be time stamp. There we go. So now if we save this, something happens. There we go, we're back. And if I type the letter E, we can see the selection on the bottom, and we can select one. But still, not a lot is happening. It doesn't seem like anything is happening once we click it. So let's figure out what we need to do next to actually make it selected and follow our cursor. And then once we click the left mouse button, it actually flies over the screen with that specific reaction. To make those reactions show, we can go up all the way up and then we can define a new use interval hook. Yep, this is a use interval, which is coming from our custom hooks. Uh, we just call it like this, and then provide, first of all, the callback function that we're calling in a specific interval. And then how often are we calling it? In this case, every 100 milliseconds. This hook has to be imported from our custom hooks. And I took this one from Dan Abramov's blog, where he talked a bit about how to create that React hook, which in this case is very useful. The only thing it does is it calls a specific function with a specific interval. So what do we want to do every 100 milliseconds? Well, here is where that is pressed state comes to play, we can check if the cursor state dot mode is triple equal to cursor mode dot reaction. So first of all, are we doing any reactions? And then and cursor state dot is pressed. So are we currently pressing our mouse? and if the cursor exists that as well. So we want to make sure that all of those conditions are true. And then 
we call the set reaction. Be careful, that is set reaction right here, singular, where we can call a callback function that gives us access to the previous reactions. And then we call reactions.concat. Okay, what we want to concat? Well, we want to concatenate new reactions. So we get an object where we need to specify the point of a new emoji. So we can do that by giving it the x axis of cursor dot x and y axis of cursor dot y. We want to give it a value, which is the cursor state dot reaction, and a timestamp of date dot now to know when we're doing it. And let's not forget to close it properly. So it looks like to me that we have to close one more object right here, then an array, then one parenthesis and one more parenthesis to close the set reaction. And we might have one extra right here, which we don't need. And one extra here. There we go. That's good. So we're finally back. We're setting the interval. And now if we press the letter E and select fire, oh my God, it's actually firing. We can see a lot of fire emojis going every 100 milliseconds. If you want to be really crazy, you could knock this down to about 20 and then try it one more time. And now it's even crazier. You can see it's even creating some weird shapes right here, which is great. I think this was done by the flying emoji or the flying reaction by the live blocks team. So this is great. Now that we have that, we can bring it to 100 milliseconds. I like that. You can do something different as well. But now, not yet will these reactions show to the other person. And that's the only goal. That's the only reason why we're doing them, not to admire them on our own screen, but so we can convey our emotions and reactions to another person live in real time. So to do that, we'll have to use the broadcast hook coming from live blocks. We can do that by saying const broadcast is equal to use broadcast event coming from the live blocks config like so. This allows us to broadcast events to other users in the room. So still within this if right after we're done setting the state, we can call the broadcast hook or not a hook rather what the hook returned, and then pass in an object with the x position of cursor x, y position of cursor y, and the value of cursor state dot reaction. So now if we do this, and press the fire, we can see it's going, but we still cannot see it on the other screen. What are we missing? We've done half the job. We've broadcasted the events from the sender, but we haven't yet received them or listened to them from the receiver. So what we can do is use another hook. And that hook is called use event listener coming from liveblocks config that accepts the event data and then we can have a function to do something with that data. Essentially, it gets fired every time that an event gets broadcasted. So here we first get the event by saying const event is equal to event data as reaction event. So we know exactly what type it is. And then we call the set reaction where we get all the previous reactions and then do the same exact thing. So we can copy this entire set state, and we want to replicate it to the other user. In this case, we're not only getting the event data, but rather the actual event from the event data. That's great. And also here, it's no longer going to be a reaction. It's just the value. And it's not coming from cursor state. That was it for our screen, but rather it's coming directly from the event. So now once again, TypeScript is quite useful with live blocks because they have documented their types incredibly well. So they're here to save us whenever we do some silly mistakes. So with that said, what do you say that we give it one last chance? I opened up the second browser. Let's try to pull up the event. And would you look at that? Cannot read properties of null reading X happening within our live.tsx line 45. That is right here. And yeah, that makes sense. We have access to the cursor data on the sender browser, 
but we don't have access to it on the receiver end. So instead of getting the cursor position, we have to get the event position. Same as for the value right here. Great. So if we try it one more time, press the letter E and select some fires, and they're actually going up in the air. We can make them light up our live blocks Figma clone because soon enough, we're going to start converting this live environment inside of which we have the emojis, we have the chat, we have the cursor tracking into what is yet to become a Figma clone with a fully featured set of canvas functionalities. Now there's one small detail we we'll still have to do to optimize our app when it comes to these emotions and reactions. And that is something that you might never think about, but it could be very expensive in terms of your app efficiency in the long run. And if many users are using the app, see when you do a reaction, these emojis show up and then they expire, or at least you think so they hide from the screen, but they are still added to the state. So right now we have hundreds, if not even thousands of these saved to the state and we have to clear them. So let's do that right now by going above our use interval and use event listener and creating a new interval. We can say use interval. Once again, we have a callback function in between it and we can clear them. Let's say every second here, we can remove the reactions that are not visible anymore by calling the set reaction, getting in the reaction itself, and then filtering them out by calling reaction dot filter where we get R for each reaction and we filter it. If the reaction or R dot timestamp is greater than date dot now minus let's say about four seconds. So we cleared the ones that are completely invisible by this point. Now, once we have done this, you should see no difference in our app. Everything should still work well, but they will be getting cleared in the background. So with that in mind, we have now implemented a couple of functionalities. We have implemented the live reactions. Of course, we have also implemented the cursor chat where you can type something out. And finally, we have the cursors itself, which you can follow and see what the other person is doing. Now I noticed one small bug, and that is if you go into the chat and type something that has the letter E in it, then on the sender display, it appears like they want to do an emotion and not continue typing. So that's definitely something we have to fix. But before we do that, there's one last collaboration tool I want to implement from live blocks, and then we can finalize the live features and start fusing them with the Figma canvas. And that feature is the live avatar stack. It allows you to see who are the other users in your application. There we go. And we're going to implement this on the navigation bar of our app. So we can get started by copying this avatar code, which is a very small piece of code, just containing an image of the avatar and we'll create it within our components within a new folder called users. And then within users, we can create a new avatar .tsx, inside of which we can paste the code that we copied. We can delete the comment and just make our life a bit easier. Of course, in this case, we want to figure out what exactly will we show. And here they pass the name and the source as props to this avatar component. So with that in mind, we have to see where this component is getting called. So we can go to the index file right here and find the place where we're calling it. So let's copy this entire example, go back to the code and then create a new file within users called active users dot TSX. And within there, we can paste our function example. Of course, we can turn that into a const and call it active users it is equal to an arrow function where we return all of this. And then we immediately export default active users. Great. And we must not forget to do a couple of imports. We want to import use others from liveblocks config. We want to import the use self from the config as well. And we want to import the avatar from that slash avatar. I believe this is it for now. We do have some more styles coming directly from liveblocks. So let's get the styles as well.
In this case, we have this avatar.module.css directly within the avatar. So let's copy that file by calling it right here, avatar.module.css and paste it. And the second one is just the index.module.css. So we can also paste it right here, index.module.css and paste this right here. That allows us to call these files. We can call the index within this active users. We can import styles coming from dot slash index.module.css. That's for the active users. And for the avatar, we can import styles from avatar module CSS. Great. I believe that's going to be it from what we need for this code. So now we can go back to our current application and actually use these active users within somewhere. And where else are we going to use them than within our navbar? So let's create a new component within the components folder called navbar.tsx and run RAFCE. This is going to be our navbar. Since I don't want to waste your time on creating the navbar, I'm sure you've done that hundreds of times so far. I'm going to provide you with the code to the starting version of the navbar in the readme down below. So just find it and then override what we have right now. You'll notice that it is a simple navbar. We have to fix our import for the navbar props. So just manually or automatically import it once again. And you can see that we just have a simple nav. And we can now use that navbar within our page. So let's navigate over to the page.tsx. And right above our live, we can now put the navbar right here by importing it from components navbar. And you can see that now it's struggling to get the avatar or to show it. So we can go to the navbar and you can see that we are using the active users component right here. And within active users, we are displaying our avatar, but it looks like it cannot get access to the current user that info that avatar. So what we can do is just console log it to see if we're getting something back from the use self hook console that log. And I'm going to console log the current user. If we do this and open up the inspect element and go to the console, scroll up, we can see that we do get back an object that contains some information, but the ID info and everything else is basically either false or undefined. And that's because we don't yet have any users in our application. We haven't done proper auth. So for that reason, we're going to modify the way that we show this user a bit or this avatar. What we can do is say, if there is a current user, then we're going to remove this div and we're going to only show the avatar component like this, but to the avatar, we won't be passing any kind of source. We're going to figure out a source programmatically within the avatar component. Instead, we'll pass a name of you and we'll pass some other styles such as a border of three pixels. And we can also pass a border primary green. So we know that's us. And we can show this current user on top because that is us. So we can do that right here below this div. Current user is first. Now we also want to modify the second time we call the user or the avatar. Here, we want to pass another source, we don't have it, but we can pass the name of a call to generate random name, which is coming from libutils. If you check it out, it just finds some random adjectives and random animal names, and then puts them together. I believe live blocks created this example. So now we can go into the avatar. And here we can also pass the other styles equal to minus ml dash three. So now we can go into the avatar and accept these new props, such as name that we already had, as well as other styles. And now that we have this image, we can just render a proper source. In this case, we want to spell out a URL coming directly from live blocks. So we can say HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash live blocks dot IO forward slash avatars forward slash avatar dash 
and then math that floor math dot random inside of it times 30. And then we enclose it with a dot PNG. So this is going to generate a random image. Instead of using a regular image, we can use a Next.js image tag by importing it from next image. In that case, we don't need a size, we can simply say fill. And we're already taking the class name from the styles. We also need to provide it an alt tag, which is going to be the name. And let's also provide additional class names right here by making this a template string that accepts the styles.avatar. Then we can also give it the other styles like this. And finally, we can set the height to nine and width to nine as well. And close it right here. And we need to modify the types. In this case, we no longer have the source. We have the other styles of a type string. Now, if we save this, and reload, you'll notice that we have an error importing JS PDF. Okay, why all of a sudden we have to do something with JS PDF? I think that's because we use this generate random name function, which we imported right here from utils. And because of that, it might have looked into the imports of this file, and we didn't yet actually install this package. So for now, we can comment it out and we can comment out its use right here at the bottom. We're gonna bring it back later on. But once we do that, we should be back to our application. And now Next.js gives us an error saying that we cannot use images whose sources we didn't validate. So we can go to our next config.js, and within here, we can add images. That's an array, and here an object within it where we specify the protocol of HTTPS. We specify the host name, say that the images will come from liveblocks.io, and we specify the port of just an empty string. Now, if we save this and reload, you'll see the app broke. So we just have to run npm run dev one more time. And how nice, Next.js automatically lets us know that we have misspelled or mistyped something in our config. So it's not TypeScript saving us right here, it's Next.js itself. It's saying that it expected object at images and we provided it an array. So the images itself indeed has to be an object, but inside it has to have these remote patterns, which is then an array that we have created right here. So we can copy this and instead of putting it directly within images, we can put it right here under remote patterns. And that allows us to rerun our application but then also I can notice that I said post instead of port right here. So thank you, Next.js and Vercel. If I switch this up right now, you can see that we are live on localhost 3000 once again, and hopefully we'll be able to see something. Oh, would you look at that? Okay, this is exciting. So we can see our Liveblocks Figma clone, but at the top, we can see our Fig Pro. We got that immediately because I used this starter for our navigation bar that contains the logo image. And then we have the active users, which we have developed, letting us know there are two different users on our app right now. We have you, which is us, and we have a bright penguin. So now we can kind of make it fit better with our current application and not make it look like this. It should always be sticky at the top of our app. So let's do that first before we check out all of the avatar functionalities. To fix it, we'll have to go to our page.tsx and we'll have to modify the styles of our div. Or while we're here, let's call it a main because this is our main div for the entire application. We can give it a class name equal to h-screen, meaning it will take the full height of the screen, 100vh. And we can also give it an overflow of hidden, which will remove this ugly scroll on the right side. If we save it, now we can see only the nav bar, which is taking the entire screen and we cannot scroll anymore. So now let's figure out why that is. The first thing we can do is wrap the live part into its own section. So that's gonna be a section with a class name equal to flex, h-full, and then flex-row. And we can put the live right within it. If we do that, that's not gonna do anything on its own. So we have to go into the nav bar and then into our active users. Here we copy the code from Liveblocks' example, 
and they use the H screen, which in this case we don't need. We don't want it to take the full screen. And now we have a more regular nav bar. But let's fully style this exactly as it should by modifying this div right here and giving it a class name of flex, items dash center, justify dash center, and a gap of one. There we go. Now they appear on the right side. We're checking for the current user. Then we're checking if there are any other users. In this case, we don't need the info. And finally, if there are more users, then we display a text of more, which in this case, we don't have any more. Now, there's one weird thing happening once we move our cursor around, and that is that the colors change. We don't want them to change because we want each user to have their own color. So to fix it, we can memoize the active users component. We can do that by using the use memo hook. So we can take this entire part that has to do something with the users, the actual JSX code, take it, copy it, move it from here, and then create a new variable right here on top called const memoized users is equal to use memo hook coming from React where we can simply return what we copied right here. So the return of this div, make sure to add a return statement first. There we go. Now, the second parameter to the memo is when will it actually refresh? And it will refresh when the others join. So we can say others.length changes, then we will change the colors. And for that, we also have to know when the others have joined. And instead of using the others, we can use the users right here to see when the length of the users has changed. Finally, we can return the memoized users instead of always changing those users. That way, once you move around, you're going to notice that they're not changing at all, which is exactly how it should be. But if you reload, sure, you're going to get new colors. But the most important part is that those users are exactly the same color for the entire duration of your session. So now we can nicely see that there are two users currently logged in. We can even chat with each other by typing something out. Or if we're really happy, we can also show some emojis. So this is looking great. And we can see that the other user is online with us. Now let's modify these styles a bit. And to modify the styles, we can go to avatar module CSS. And we can simply change the width from 56 to something like 40 pixels. There we go. That fits a bit better. And we'll also have to add some padding. And we'll do that not within the avatars, but within the active users. So that's right here in the div by giving it a padding top of something like, let's do eight pixels. And instead of padding top, we can do padding Y, meaning top and bottom. And this is looking great. With that said, do you remember that issue where if we start typing and type the letter E, immediately the chat disappears? Let's go ahead and fix that. The fix for that will be within the cursor chat. So let's go to cursor chat. And then to this div, we can provide a special property on key up that's going to accept a callback function that gets the event. And we simply need to stop the propagation, meaning stop doing other stuff and focus on the typing. So E dot stop propagation. If we do this and open up the other window and start typing something like test, you can see that we can actually type test without being interrupted by the emoji. But now if we close it with escape key and type the E key, we can actually show the emoji. I think this would be the perfect time to show what we have done so far with all of the live functionalities in the full screen. So I will expand these browsers, one here, and I'm going to take half the screen and take it for the other. And as you can see, two different screens, you can think of these as two different users on two different browsers on two different computers. They are looking at the same application at the same time in the browser, they can see each other's statuses, and they can start chatting. Hey, let's design this app. And immediately it works in real time. And they can also share different emojis. So with that in mind, I'm going to close one browser, which means that we have implemented the majority of our live functionalities 
using live blocks. And the reason why I wanted to do this first before doing the full Figma clone is to show you that you can do this on absolutely any application. What is our app even right now? It's just a simple piece of text, but still a piece of text powered by all of these real-time collaboration functionalities. So it can be a dashboard where you can communicate with other people viewing it at the same time. It can be a landing page, like what Vercel is doing with their comments, where you can leave comments to request some changes. It can be like what Figma is doing to collaborate on creating the design. And that is exactly what we're doing in this video. And you will learn how to do it all. So for now, I'm going to close all of the currently open files to have a clean working environment. And we'll start converting this piece of text into a full blown canvas on which you'll be able to add elements and interact with them in real time with another person. So I wanted to say the exciting stuff starts now, but this entire thing has been incredibly exciting to me. But let's say that the second exciting part of this video starts now. To get started with creating our canvas, we can go to our page.tsx and we can start focusing on the layout of our application, such as the left sidebar and the right sidebar and then the canvas in the middle. So let's do that right away. Let's put the left sidebar right here on the left side or on top by calling it a left sidebar, which is a self-closing component. And we can duplicate it and turn it into a right sidebar right here at the bottom next to the live. There we go. So this will temporarily break the application, but at least we know that we have the structure ready. What we have to do next is actually create those two components. So let's go to our components and create right here in the root of the components, the left sidebar dot TSX where we can run RAFCE as well as the right sidebar where we can call RAFCE as well. This leaves us with the ability to import those two components and then reload the page to see what we have. Although you cannot see it very well, right here we have left sidebar and on the right side we have the right sidebar. While we're here, we can also give them some additional styling. So let's turn them into a section and let's give this section a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, border dash T as in top, border dash primary dash gray dash 200, BG dash primary dash black, text dash primary dash gray dash 300, min dash W dash 227 pixels within square brackets, sticky, left zero, H full. So it takes the full height. There we go. It's already starting to take effect. On max small devices, hidden, select none, overflow, dash Y dash auto, and a PB of 20 for padding bottom. Now we cannot seem to see it on small devices, but if we make it a bit larger and even larger, we can see the left sidebar appear right here on the left. Now let's focus on the right sidebar too by navigating to our right sidebar, also turning it into section. And what we can do is basically duplicate most of the properties from the left sidebar. So let's just copy this entire section and paste it right into the right sidebar. Of course, we'll have to rename this from left to right. And also while we're here, let's create an H3 within it. And this H3 will say design. So the right side is for the design. The left side will show all the elements. So let's give it a class name equal to PX of five, padding top of four, text dash XS and uppercase. There we go. That's better. And we can also modify this in the left sidebar by copying this H3 pasting it right here within it and saying something like elements. There we go. That's better already. Now this is starting to look more like a finished application, but what's missing is that this middle part is not yet a canvas. So what we have to do is go back right here to our page 
and we have to go into the live and within it, we have to render a canvas. So we can go all the way here to the top where we have Figma clone. We're going to remove that and we're going to render a canvas element. This doesn't have to be imported. This is just a regular HTML5 canvas. Now, this canvas doesn't seem like much at the moment. It's still just an empty screen. That's because we have to initialize all the refs, as in references, to make this canvas do something. So back in page, we have to create a canvas ref. We can do that right here at the top by saying const canvas ref is equal to use ref, which has to be imported from React. And it's going to be of a type HTML5 canvas element like this. And at the start, set to null. We'll also have to create another ref for our fabric library. So we can say const fabric ref is equal to use ref. And this one will be fabric dot canvas or null. So this is a special type that we have fabric dot canvas. And this fabric has to be imported at the top from fabric. So we can do it by saying import fabric from fabric. Now we are properly specifying the types. And at the start, it's also going to have the value of null. The canvas ref is the reference to the canvas element that we'll use to initialize the fabric canvas. And the fabric ref will allow us to perform operations on the canvas. It's kind of like a copy of the created canvas so that we can use it outside of the canvas event listeners. And there's a third ref we'll have to define const is drawing. It is a Boolean variable that tells us if the user is currently drawing on the canvas or not, meaning if the free form drawing mode is enabled. So we can say this is equal to use ref at the start set to false. And finally, we can use all these refs to initialize our fabric canvas. We're going to do that within a use effect. So we can start a new use effect and make it load only at the start meaning we're going to leave the dependency array empty for now. We can import use effect from react and we can start creating the canvas by saying const canvas is equal to initialize fabric, which is important from lib canvas. And to it, we need to pass the canvas ref as well as the fabric ref that looks like this. And we have to put that within an object because initialize fabric only accepts one parameter. Now that we have our canvas, we can listen to mouse down events on the canvas, which are fired once the user clicks on the canvas. And we can do that by saying canvas dot on mouse down. And then here we have a callback function that gives us the option to make a decision what we want to do once that happens. And here we want to call a utility function called handle canvas mouse down to which we can pass an object containing the options, the canvas, the is drawing property, and later on a few additional properties as well. And we also have to pass a few more additional properties, such as selecting which shape are we currently interacting on. Since we don't have the possibility to choose a shape right now, we don't have any shapes. We just have to create a ref for it, a reference. So we can say const shape ref is equal to use ref. That's of a type fabric dot object or null at the start set to null. This is a reference to the shape that the user is currently drawing. And we also need to have one for the selected shape. So we can say const selected shape ref is equal to use ref of a type, either string or null at the start set to null. The selected shape ref is a reference to the shape that the user has currently selected. So if it's a rectangle, it will say rectangle. Now we can pass these two additional refs right here by saying shape ref and selected shape ref. And this mouse down will be incredibly useful once we start dealing with the elements on the canvas. But for now, we care about one even more than this mouse down, which is a resize element. Window dot add element listener 
of a type resize. And once we resize it, we call this callback function that calls the handle resize utility function to which we can pass the fabric ref. And this is not element listener, it is add event listener. So we are listening for the resizes of the canvas, such as once I do this, then the size of the canvas changes. But now the question is, what do we do with this? It doesn't seem like we have a canvas at all. Well, we're gonna put it all together right now. Remember this canvas ref? We can finally send it over as a prop to our live component and then go into it, accept it as a prop right here, of course, we have to define the type while doing that. So we can say that that's going to be of a type props. And right here, we can say type props is equal to canvas ref of a type react dot mutable ref object of a type HTML canvas element or null in case at the start it is set to null. Now, TypeScript is not going to complain. And we can use this canvas ref and pass it over to our HTML5 canvas component, which is right here. Canvas ref is equal to canvas ref, or rather just saying ref is equal to canvas ref. And another very important thing is that we have to provide the ID of canvas to our div that's wrapping the canvas. Now, if we go back, we can actually try to interact with it because we have created this mouse down functionality. But on mouse down, we have to pass specific shape ref, letting the canvas know what kind of element or shape do we want to create. At the start, it's set to null, and we don't have access to any kind of a selector to choose which kind of element we want to add. We'll create that selector within the navbar very, very soon. But for now, let me show you how to quickly get your first element on the canvas so you can feel like a real artist. The only thing you have to do is modify the selected shape ref initial value to something like rectangle. That way, once you click on it, we're gonna pass it and the handle canvas mouse down, which is our special utility function, will just create this specific shape based off of the selected shape ref. So click, and reload your screen and press on it. There we go. So now every time that you press, you're gonna get a 100 by 100 pixel wide rectangle. And then you can move those around. You can see that works right out of the bat. But right now, once you click, you're just gonna get as many as possible. This is looking great. It already feels that we can create something and we can even move them off. You can see, well, not really. Right now we're kind of a bit blocked and it's creating so many as soon as we move it around and keep our mouse down. This is just the first prototype version. Don't worry, we're gonna fix it, but you can see how it works right now. You get the idea. Now, what do you say that we add a selector to the navbar that allows us to choose between many different shapes, such as these ones right here, rectangle, circle, triangle, line, even an image upload and a free drawing. We can do all of that by adding these couple of icons to our navigation bar. So going back to the code, we can revisit the navbar component. We have a navbar with our logo and right below, or rather right to the right side of the logo, we want to add some additional elements. So we can create a UL component for an unordered list, give it a class name equal to flex and flex dash row. And right there, we can map over all of our nav items. I've already created a constant called nav elements that we can simply use and then import. If you quickly go to it, you can see that it contains the select, the rectangle, text, all different kinds of icons we want to show on our nav bar. And we can simply map over it by saying dot map, where we get each individual item of a type active element coming from types or any. And for each one, we want to immediately return an li. Please make sure that here you put a parenthesis and not the opening of the function block, because then that's not an immediate return. Now with this li, since we're mapping over different elements, we want to give it a key equal to item dot name. 
Then we also want to show something within it. Now to be able to show something within it, we have to figure out what we're mapping over. For all of these different icons that you can see on the deployed version, such as click, text, delete, and so on, they have a single value that is a string. But this rectangle one has a sub array of different elements we can show, such as rectangle, circle, and so on. So let's first deal with that one. We can do that by checking if the sub list is an array. So array dot is array, and then we pass the item dot value to it. If it is array, then we want to return a special component called shapes menu like this. It is a self closing component that's going to render all of our items. Of course, if we save it now, it will break our app because we don't yet have this component. But before we create it, let's just follow through with the rest of the structure. If it's not an array, then we can check if item question mark that value is triple equal to comments. If it is equal to comments, then we can open up a new ternary and return something known as a new thread. This is also another not self closing component that will create. And finally, else if it's not a comment, and if it's not an array, then we want to render a regular button. For now, I'm going to leave it just a basic button later on, we're going to turn it into a chat CN button. So now we have to create the skeletons of these few components. And throughout the entire build of this application, there are going to be many components, which are just simple drop down menus. And once again, I'm here to let you experience the build of the Figma clone on your own, but to save your time and to make your learning focused on exactly what you need for building Figma and not building drop downs or nav bars, I went ahead and prepared a couple of components for you so you can more easily follow along with the video. A folder containing just a few of the components we'll be using for this build will be in the readme down below. Download it, unzip it, and then drag and drop it to your components folder. It's going to be called new components. And from it, you can simply extract all of the files into the components folder, such as the comments folder, the settings folder, the shapes menu that we need, and then two of these components that we already have, which is the left sidebar, which we can replace, and the nav bar, which we can replace too. So now that we have consumed all of these components, we just have to make it work together. You notice we have a lot of warnings right here with imports. So let's fix those. For you, this part might already be fixed, but in case it isn't, we just have to make it say add forward slash constants and add forward slash types. This component called new thread, we don't yet have, so we can create it by going to components, then creating a new folder called comments, and then within the comments, we can create a new component called new thread.tsx, run RAFCE. And an important thing is that this one will accept children as it props, as it will have some elements within it. So for now, we can simply return children. That's the only thing that we have to do for now. And you can notice that it is a named import. So we can just say export const new thread instead of saying export default. So now if we do that, all of the imports are good besides the UI button. That's because this button is a chat CN component. So this is the first time that I'm going to show you how to install a chat CN component. Going back to chat CN's docs, you can search for a button component. There we go. Just a simple button. And you just need to copy this installation command, copy it. And then within a new terminal, paste it, mpx chatcn ui add latest add button. This command will ask you now whether you want to install it. And in a couple of seconds, it will automatically be installed. So if we fix this path right here, you can see that now it's properly getting the button. And with that, our navbar should be good. But we're not yet ready to see our application because of some of the other issues that we have in our left sidebar. So in our left sidebar, we also have to fix the path, or maybe it was already working for you. And we have to move into the shapes menu, which is if you remember the component we started to work on here, we have to install another component from chat CN, which is the drop down menu. So let's search for it, drop down menu. 
and the installation command is everything the same, but this time we add a drop down menu instead of a button. While that is happening, I'm just gonna fix these imports for me and everything should be good with the menu as well. Besides this one small last thing, and that is that if you go to the shapes menu, you can see that we're trying to get the value out of the active element. And that is that if you go to the shapes menu, you can see that we're trying to get the value out of the active element right here. And our shapes menu is expecting it and our nav bar is expecting it as well, but we're not yet passing it from the home page. So right here in the home page, where we're calling our nav bar, we have to pass some additional props to it. Specifically now, we're wondering about which element is currently clicked from the nav bar. So right at the top, I can create a new use state property and I'm gonna call it active element, set active element. At the start, set to an object that has a name, which is an empty string. It has a value, which is an empty string and it has an icon, which is also an empty string. And we have to import use state from React. We can also define the type as active element coming from types. And now that we have this active element, we also have to do its counterpart, which is a function called handle active element, which will allow us to choose different elements from the nav bar. So we get one parameter, which is LM, of a type active element. And within here, we can set active element to element that we pass in. And for now, we can set the selected shape ref dot current to be equal to lm question mark dot value and say as string. There we go. Now we can pass the active element and the handle active element into the nav bar. So let's scroll down and expand it. And to it, we can pass the active element equal to active element just as a prop. And as the second one, we can pass the handle active element equal to handle active element. Now moving into the nav bar, we are properly accepting all of those props at the top. Later on, there's going to be a few more. And would you look at that? The full nav bar is now complete. I know we brought it in with some of the other components, but it is looking great. We can select different things. For example, this is just the cursor. And then we can click right here to open up the selector for different elements. So now if I click the circle and if I click right here, it's gonna do a circle. If I select triangle, it's gonna do a triangle. You get the idea, right? We can do also rectangles as well as lines. All of this is working incredibly well but for now, we just have a listener to be able to do the mouse down. We cannot yet move things, although yeah, we can, but then it adds additional ones once we try to do something more complex. So we're just getting there. We're doing things step by step. The free drawing is also there, but we can improve it still. But already, this is huge work that we've done so far. But now, let's back to what we have been working on for this entire time making this functional in real time. So now if I reload this page, and if I start adding some rectangles right here, you can notice that they don't get added on the other screen. Of course, we can chat and say hi, and even do some emojis as we learned before. But unfortunately, the main part of our application, which are the actual elements we're adding on the screen, don't show up on the other screen. And for that, we're gonna utilize the last live blocks feature of the day called storage. We're gonna store the session in real time that's gonna keep track of all of these elements, their positions, sizes, colors, and more. And then we're gonna replicate that session within a live blocks room so that both of these users can share the same board. To make that happen, I'm gonna close everything we have right now and start focusing on implementing Live block storage. Live block storage, real time data store for collaborative documents. Or in simple words, it's basically a place where we can store documents or any kind of data needed for real time collaboration. In our case, we'll be showing Fabric.js elements that we want to show to everyone in our real time room. So if somebody is creating an element like I am on this screen right here, 
Everybody that's in that room should be able to see me move elements, create them, change colors, and do everything else in real time. Not to mention that we'll also soon be able to implement their history API that allows us to undo or redo some actions. So with that said, how do we implement it? Let's clear this right here so we don't have too many elements. And let's navigate to our page.tsx. Right at the top of our page, we'll use one hook. That hook is called use storage. And that use storage hook by LiveBlocks allows us to store data in key value stores and automatically sync it to other users. Or in other words, we create a subscription and updates to the selected pieces of data. So let's say const canvas objects, which is going to be equal to the use storage hook coming from LiveBlocks config. There we have a callback function where we get the root and then we can say root dot canvas objects. This is just a selector. So if you hover over it, you can see that we extract arbitrary data from live block storage using an arbitrary selector function. So now we can navigate to the use storage hook within live blocks config. Here is where it's being mentioned. And if we scroll a bit up where we can find the storage, here is where we can add some fields that we need to keep track of. So in this case, we can add a field called canvas objects, which is going to be something known as a live map. And that's going to be of a type string and any. This live map has to be imported from the live blocks client. It's just a data storage option. So here we can see that the live map is similar to a JavaScript map that is synchronized to all clients. It's essentially key should be a string and value should match the JSON structure. So now that we have this, you can see that our use storage is no longer complaining because it knows that canvas objects now is a read only map. So now that we have these canvas objects, let's find a way to actually update them. And the way we do that using live blocks is by using the use mutation hook. So we can say const sync shape in storage. So we sync the shape that we create and we call the use mutation hook coming from live blocks config where we can immediately destructure the storage like this. And then as the second parameter, we get back the object. And finally, we can open up a function block. Now let's just ensure that this is good. We have the use mutation, we destructure the storage. And then as the second parameter to that use mutation, we put the object. Oh, looks like I closed this one too soon, right? Here is a comma. And then after we're closing it. So I think we are good now but we have to close one more right here. And then we must not to also forget to pass a dependency array to the use mutation hook. If you open it up, it's going to say that first you create a callback function that lets you mutate a live block state. The first argument gets passed into your callback with mutation context. And here they give you an example, like you can change the color of something with the fill layers. You can also delete layers and do some other actions. Like in this case, we simply want to first check if we have an object we're working with. So if we don't have an object, we simply return. But then if we do have an object, we want to destructure its object ID by destructuring object ID from the object. Then we want to turn the fabric object into JSON format so that we can store it in the key value store by saying const shape data is equal to object dot to JSON. Then we get the shape data dot object ID, and we set it to object ID. So essentially, once we convert it into JSON, we make sure that the object ID of the JSON object is set to the correct object ID, then we need to get canvas objects by saying const canvas objects. And that's equal to storage dot get canvas objects. So essentially, we're trying to pull existing objects from the live block storage. Finally, we call the canvas objects and call the dot set method on it. It's provided to us by live blocks, and it allows us to set a value. So now we can set the object ID of the shape we're syncing, and we can make it equal to the shape data 
that we're passing over. And this will sync the shape in storage. Now, the question is, where do we use this sync shape in storage? Well, we'll have to use it in many places, such as when moving elements, when deleting them, when clearing out the entire canvas. But first, let's call it on move. So far, we have developed one part, which is this mouse down. But now, below the mouse down, we also want to develop the mouse move. So let's duplicate the canvas that on mouse down, make it to mouse move, and then handle canvas mouse move, which is another utility function coming from lib canvas. To it, we can pass the options, the canvas, the is drawing, the shape ref, select that shape ref as well. And finally, we can pass the sync shape in storage. So after moving it, this function will take this sync shape in storage, and it will call it with the specified element. So now if I go back and create a new element, like a rectangle, we get an error. Let's see what the error is saying. Cannot read properties of undefined reading set under canvas objects. So now if we go back right here to where we're calling that sync shape in storage, it's complaining that it cannot get the canvas objects. There's a couple of reasons why this might be, but let's take it step by step. First, I want to move into the room.tsx file. And here we have to do some modifications. As you can see, we're defining the initial presence right here. And it wouldn't be bad to define the cursor as null at the start, to define the cursor color as null at the start, as well as defining the editing text as null at the start as well not related to storage, but again, it's good to set those default values. Now we can define something that's more important for the storage, which, which is a new property below initial presence called initial storage. And that's going to be equal to an object that's going to have the canvas objects in there equal to a new live map, which is coming from live blocks client. And we call it as a function or as a constructor in this case, rather. So now that we do this, we have some initial storage to work with. And while we're here, I just noticed that we're using the old loader. So we can immediately call our new self closing loader by importing it from components loader. Now, if we reload, you'll see this nice looking loader at the start of the screen. And we can try adding a new element. As you can see now, we're not getting any errors, which is much better than before. But this is definitely some kind of a weird situation that we're having right here. It almost feels like we're doing some kind of a Fibonacci sequence or like a golden ratio with these cubes, the way that they end one on top of another. So before we continue doing this, we might need to fix up our on mouse down or on mouse move events. So let me go back to the page. And let's continue writing all of our listeners. So in this case, I'm guessing that we're missing the mouse up. So I'm going to take this and duplicate it one time below, modify it to mouse up. We also need to pass it the options, the canvas, the is drawing, we're providing the shape ref, the selected shape ref, the sync shape in storage. And also we have to provide another function which we created before called set active element. And we pass all of those to handle mouse up like this. Of course, let's spell it properly. Handle canvas mouse up. There we go. In this case, we don't need the options. And we're missing something known as an active object ref. This ref is the one that we didn't create yet. So we can create it right here on top by saying const active object ref is equal to use ref fabric object at the start set to null. And the reason why we're passing it into this function, if we look into the handle mouse up, you'll see that we are resetting the active object ref to null. And the reason why we need this active object in the first place is so that once we click on a specific element, we know which one is currently selected. So with that said, we're now done with the handle mouse up with the handle mouse move, as well as the handle mouse down. And now would you look at that? We can actually create one element 
It doesn't create many more once we do that, just one. Or if you want to, you can create more. And now we actually have the mouse up and mouse down, which means that it doesn't just create a 100 by 100 pixels rectangle, you can actually drag it around to create different sizes of those rectangles. And you can move them around and they all look great. There we go. That's a little winky face for you for coming this far into the video. Now, with this in mind, there's one question that remains. And that is, is this synced to the other browser? So let's check it out. If we reload the screen and reload this one too, besides that great looking loading, you can see that the elements are actually not getting synced yet. So there's still some work we need to do before we can actually see the elements on the other screen. And what we have to do is re-render the canvas. Every time that there are changes in our, how are they called, canvas objects, we have to re-render our canvas to show those new changes on the other screen. So to re-render our canvas, we can just add a use effect. And this use effect has a callback function, as we know, and will rerun whenever the canvas objects change. Inside of here, we can call the render canvas function coming from lib canvas. And to it, we can pass a couple of arguments. To see what parameters it wants, we can control click into it. And we can see that we need to pass the fabric ref, the canvas objects and the active object ref. What we do with it is we simply enliven all of the objects, which basically removes them from the canvas. I really took my time to nicely document and comment out all of these features. So in case you want to dive deeper into how all of this works, so you can see it all right here. So first we clear the canvas, and then we render all of the objects from the storage. That's it. That's the magic of how this works. So if we go back, we need to pass it the fabric ref. We need to pass it the canvas objects. And finally, the active object ref. If we do that and save it, we can see all of these already after a refresh, which is pretty amazing. But now we might have a bit too many to be able to see what's happening. Let's kind of move them a bit down on the screen. Oh, and would you look at that? We have too many on the other screen as well. That is great. But just so we don't have too many right now while we're working on it, and while we don't implement the clear function, we can go back to the LiveBlocks dashboard and clear the storage there. So if you go back to your project and then rooms, you'll be able to see one room that we have. And then you can go to that specific room and you can see the canvas objects storage. How cool is that? What we can do here is just delete it. And that way, the storage for this specific room will be deleted. So now going back, it's completely empty and we can reload the page. With that in mind, if I now create an element right here, you can see how cool this is. We can automatically see it being created on the other screen in real time. And I was just about to say that the moving works as well, but if you move it around, you can see that right now, everything is being synced besides the moving part. So to do that as well, we just have to add another listener, such as canvas.on object modified. We again have the callback function of options, and then we can call a new handle canvas object modified. And to it, we provide the options as well as sync shape in storage. If we now save this and collapse it, if we move the element around, you'll be able to see it move as well. And that's exactly what happens. This is great. You can now resize the shapes, modify them, create a lot of stuff in this single canvas. But this is still only like a simple Miro board or something like that, like a whiteboard. But this is a real Figma clone and we will provide many more additional functionalities on top of just creating some elements and moving some blocks around. We'll allow you to create real interfaces even do freeform drawing and upload images. More on that soon, but before that, we cannot have too many elements on the screen. So what we need to do is implement the delete, the delete 
and clear functionalities. And to implement the delete or the reset, we have to connect it to the delete and reset buttons on the navbar. So if we go right here to this navbar, you'll see that we are already passing the handle active element. And that handle active element is being used right here on this button, handle active element with a specific item. So it's going to trigger a specific action. But now it's up to us to actually implement which action does this handle active element do. Right now, it's simply setting the active element and setting the selected shape ref current to that element's value. But now within here, we also want to implement a switch statement where the key is the element value. And within it, we want to check if the case is reset, in which case we want to delete all shapes from the canvas. So here we can call the delete all shapes, which is a special mutation function that we have to create right above the handle active element. So we can say const delete all shapes is equal to and once again, we're going to use the use mutation hook coming from live blocks, where we get the storage. And then if I manage to close it properly this time, we need to pass, we need to open up a function block, and then pass an empty dependency array at the end. This is how we do use mutations in live blocks. So right within here, we need to get the current canvas objects from the storage by saying const canvas objects is equal to storage dot get canvas objects. Then if the store doesn't exist, or it's empty, so if no canvas objects, or even if it's empty right now, right here, canvas objects, we can call the dot size property on it, since it's a map is triple equal to zero, we can simply return true as in deleted. Then if that is not the case, we can map over all of the canvas objects by using the for off property. So for const, we destructure the key and the value of canvas objects dot entries like this. And then we simply call the canvas objects dot delete and then we delete a specific key, or in this case, all of the keys. Finally, we want to return canvas objects that size is triple equal to zero. This will return true if the store is indeed empty. So now on the reset switch case, we're calling the delete all shapes. There's also an additional thing we have to do, which is not only clear them from live block storage, but also clear them from the existing canvas by saying fabric ref dot current dot clear. And we can set active element to be equal to default nav element coming from constants. And then we break it. So this is it for the reset. And this default nav element is just basically the select. That means that if we delete everything, we'll be able to just move to the select so we can continue moving some stuff. So what do you say? Should we test reset? Reset is connected to this button right here that has the arrow following its tail. So if I click it, it's gone. And on the other screen, it's gone as well. This is great. Oh, but we have some kind of a bug where on the current screen, we can see that the elements reappeared. Let me just reload one more time on both browsers. It looks like it's empty. If I create a new rectangle, it works it moves, and I can clear. That's good. If we need to fix some bugs, we're going to fix them in the future. For now, it's looking good. Now, alongside reset, what do you say that we also implement the delete functionality? So right here, we can add another case, in this case, a case of delete, and call the handle delete functionality, which is coming from our utility function from lib key events, we can call it like so to it, we need to pass the fabric ref dot current as any just for TypeScript. And as the second parameter, we have to pass the similar thing what we're calling here, which is a mutation 
in this case to delete all shapes, but in this case to just delete a single shape from storage. Delete shape from storage. And now we can create that function right here below delete all shapes, const delete shape from storage. It's also a mutation that looks like this, that accepts the storage, which is destructured and the object ID. We have to close it like this, and also add the dependency array. And then within it, we simply want to say const canvas objects is equal to storage dot get canvas objects to first retrieve them, or to retrieve that specific one, and then say canvas objects dot delete the object ID. That's it. That's how we delete it. Now we're passing that to our case of delete. And once we delete it, we can also set active element to the default nav element, which is select once again. And it looks like I have an extra column right here after the case. We are back within our app. We can create a new shape. Let's do something like a circle this time. And let's try to delete it. I can click on it and click delete. And it looks like it doesn't get deleted. Let's see what else can we do to make it happen. I think that there's a special function in Fabric.js that allows us to dispose of a canvas. So it's a method that clears all the events and listeners and everything and allows us to kind of put it to trash. Here is a documentation page for that element. Not the prettiest one, I know but it's a function called dispose that essentially clears a canvas element and removes all of its event listeners. So without it, it's going to be hard to properly delete an element. So if we go to this use effect where we initialize the canvas and its listeners right here, we can return as we usually do in react to do some cleanup and we can call the canvas dot dispose right here. This will help with the deletion. So if we go right here, if we create a new element, and now if we click delete, after selecting it, it actually deletes it. So we can open up the second browser, maybe we can even create some stuff right here. And let's try to delete one. That works. Let's try to create two, one. And let's do a triangle. There we go. And let's try to now clean up everything that works as well. So now not only we can have the selection right here, we have the rectangle circle triangle line and free drawing as well. And we can also delete individual elements or reset the entire canvas. We are getting there, we're just building features of the features. Now that we have the live functionalities, and now that the entire canvas is set up, I think it's been quite some time until we have seen both of our sidebars. So what do you say that I extend this just a bit so we can see our sidebars, especially I'm wondering about the left sidebar. Within here, we'll show all of the elements that we are creating in our browser, such as this nice looking shape, and also all of the other elements, circles, rectangles, pieces of text, doesn't matter, they should all show up right here. And doing that couldn't be easier. The only thing we have to do is go back to our page, which is where we just were. And right here, we have to pass the canvas objects. Remember, the canvas objects are all of the objects we're storing in live blocks storage. And we have to pass them to our left sidebar as a prop. As a matter of fact, we can look into the left sidebar and see that it's accepting all shapes, which is an array of shapes. So the only thing we have to do is say all shapes is equal to array dot from, and then we pass the canvas objects. The reason why we have to do array from is, can you think about it? It's because the canvas objects are a map, a special structure, which is similar to array, but not exactly the same. So this way we create an array from the map. Now, if we save this, and expand our browser, you'll be able to see something truly great.
We can see our layers. You can hover over them and see the rectangle, circle, and more. And as you move them, they stay the same. But as you create new elements, like a triangle, you can see how it shows at the bottom of that list. So if you keep creating new elements, let's add a line, you can see how also it appears below. And you can keep doing that indefinitely. All of the elements are going to appear at the bottom, so you have a clear history list order of all the elements you've added. And talking about history, wouldn't it be great if we implemented undo and redo features, allowing us to be able to go one step back or one step forward as you can do in every single modern whiteboarding, designing, or documenting app like Word, Figma, or even Miro or FigJam. So let's implement undo and redo features. And I noticed that sometimes I get this error with the width, the canvas width. Remember, we said that we're gonna fix that later on. So don't worry about it too much. Now, LiveBlocks makes implementing undo and redo functionalities super simple. The only thing you have to do is use their hooks. So right here at the top, we can say const undo is equal to use undo coming from LiveBlocks config. That's a hook. And we can do the same thing for redo. So we can say const redo is equal to use redo, just like that. And of course, we need to import both of these from LiveBlocks config. These hooks allow us to do special mutations. The only thing we have to do now is call them. And the question is, when will we call this mutation? We can do it where we have all of the other event listeners on the canvas, but this one will be just a tiny bit different. As we have the resized listener right here, we can add a similar one. Window dot add event listener, and this one will be listening for the key down event, where it's gonna get the specific key that we pressed. And then we can call the handle key down coming from lib key events. And to it, we can pass the event that we clicked. We can pass the canvas, which is a ref to the fabric ref dot current. We can pass the undo and redo mutations as well as sync shape in storage. So we can properly sync it. And then also delete shape from storage, which we created before. In this case, you can see it's complaining about the type. So in all of these options, as well as the event, we can just say any for now. That way it's gonna be good. And in this case, we don't even need the options. Great. So to figure out exactly how this works, let's navigate into the handle key down and see what we're doing with this event or these mutations. If you scroll down, you can see that if we press a key, such as a control key or command key, and then a letter C, it will copy it. If we pressed command or control V, then it will paste it. But in this case, we're wondering about Z or Y, in which cases we undo or redo. So I just created this special key events function, which figures out which key you pressed. And then based off of that, it does a specific mutation. In this case, we're simply calling the undo redo functions provided to us by LiveBlocks. So now if we save this and collapse it, we can see if it actually works. I expanded my browser and now I can see 16 errors. So now for sure, I know why this error is happening. It's happening when we resize the width of the canvas. We're gonna fix this right away. But before that, let's clear out the canvas and let's test out our app's new functionalities. I'm gonna create a rectangle just by clicking right here. And maybe let's add a few more things like a circle and let's also add a triangle. Now we have those three different layers. And if I delete some of the elements by pressing on them and clicking here, now let's say that we didn't wanna delete them and we want to get our elements back. You can press control Z and it will revert all of the actions. What you can also do is maybe resize them like this. So now if I press control Z, it goes back you can do literally anything you want, such as moving the elements as well, which works incredibly well. So let's try to create something like maybe a couple of shapes right here and put them together. Let me even change the size of this one right here and put this one here. There we go, that's looking great. 
And now we can use a control Z to get back. And we can even use control or command Y to go fully back to our creation. This means that everything is working well. You can delete the elements, you can get back, and it just works great. That was undo, redo, and history. And there's one small bug you might have noticed before when creating any elements randomly, a rectangle would appear. That's because if you remember correctly, if you go to the page.tsx, the top of it, before we were playing a bit with the selected shape ref, by default setting it to rectangle. In this case, it must be set to null. So this will fix any kind of small bugs that we've had in our application and make it even more polished. With that said, we now have the left sidebar with complete history and the list of all of the elements, as well as undo redo functionalities. One thing that believe it or not works out of the box is our text element field. So you can click on the text, click right here, and you can immediately enter text elements and just write some stuff for your website. For example, this is the website hero section. You can say, welcome. And you can now include this in your design elements. Most often that's gonna be rectangles. So that's gonna look something like this. And soon enough, we'll also add colors so that you can overlay elements on top of another to make complete designs. But let me quickly explain how exactly we made the text elements work. The way it works is that we simply set the selected shape ref to text. Once that happens, we're calling this create specific shape function and into it, we pass the shape type. In this case, the shape type is the text. So we call the create text function. And this simply creates a new fabric text element, gives it a position, a fill, font family, and anything else you might want. This is more fabric related, but in case you wanna dive deeper into how we create different elements like circles, rectangles, texts, and more, you can see it all within this shapes file. Even how we create lines, circles, and triangles. With that said, the only part we're missing right now are the images. We wanna be able to upload images to make your Figma app stand out from all of the other whiteboarding tools available right now. So how do we do that? First, we have to create yet another ref. Const image input ref is equal to use ref. It's gonna be of a type HTML5 or rather HTML input element that at the start can be set to null. There we go. That's good. This image input ref will be a reference to the input element that we'll use to upload an image to the canvas. We want to upload the image automatically once we click on the image icon in the nav bar. So we're going to use this icon to trigger the event on the input without actually showing the input. That's exciting, right? So to do it, we can scroll a bit down to where we have our switch statement, where we have the reset, delete, and more. In this case, we want to add another case, and that's going to be image. We want to upload an image to the canvas. So first we want to trigger the click event on the input element by calling the image input ref dot current question mark dot click. So it's like you clicked on the form. Then we want to set the drawing mode to false. So is drawing dot current is equal to false because we're not drawing, we're uploading the image. And then you can check if fabric ref dot current, meaning if it exists, then we want to disable the drawing mode while we're uploading the image. So we can say fabric ref dot current that is drawing mode is equal to false. And finally, we just break it. Now that we have this image input ref and we're doing something with it, let's go ahead and pass it to our nav bar because that's where we want to call it from image input ref. Alongside that, we also want to pass an additional thing. And that is how do we actually handle the image upload? We can create a new function or a new handler called handle image upload, which is equal to a callback function where we get the event. And then with that event, first we stop propagation. This prevents the default behavior of the input element. And then we call the handle image upload coming from lib shapes. To it, we need to pass the file, which is e.target dot files zero. So the first file that we upload, 
we want to pass the canvas, which is just fabric ref like this as type any. We want to pass the shape ref so we know what we're creating and sync shape in storage. Great. Now all of this is being passed to our nav bar. So let's go into it. And here you can see that we are passing some information such as the image input ref and handle image upload into the shapes menu. So let's dive further to see what shapes menu is doing with it. If we scroll down, you'll see that we have this little input right here that we will never actually be able to see, but it is there. It just has a class name of hidden. But what's happening is that we're giving it the image input ref, and then it gets clicked programmatically from our code once you click on the icon on top, and it allows us to upload the image. What happens then is that this handle image upload function from shapes is going to just get the new file reader. It's going to load that image to our fabric canvas from the URL once uploaded. We're going to set some basic width and height and then add it to the current canvas. And finally, sync that shape to our storage as we would with any other element. Pretty cool, right? So let's see if it actually works. I will now clear our entire canvas and go to shapes and click image. It then prompted me to select an image. I selected one and then instead of an image, I got an error. In here, it looks like I misspelled the target. So hopefully you didn't do that. It was just me, but let's fix it. There we go, E target files, and let's give it another shot. There we go, image is there, and it acts like a real element that you can move around the screen and even resize. Notice that if you pull it from the sides, its aspect ratio changes, but if you pull it from the corners, then it just enlarges and remains in the same correct aspect ratio. In this case, I picked the illustration from our ultimate Next.js 14 course. If you haven't already, definitely check it out. If you're watching this video, you are just the type of the developer that might appreciate diving a bit deeper into what Next.js offers. We dive into details of using Tailwind, Figma, TypeScript, ChatGPT API, even Clerk for authentication, and much more. But with that said, let's celebrate the fact that we can now successfully upload all different kinds of elements to our app, including text as well. So now we can connect it to and say something like ultimate next 14 course. And then we can even do some emojis right here. All of this is coming along exceptionally well. So you might be wondering, hey, what else do we have to do to improve this even further? Well, first, in what universe is the trash icon, the image upload as well? We definitely don't want that. And maybe you even notice the mistake and it's not doing that for you, but I forgot a break. Yes, it happens when doing if statements, you don't have to have them, but with switches, especially if you're not returning, you wanna be careful about adding your breaks. So now that's not gonna happen. The delete will delete and the upload will upload. So with that said, let's be serious. What do we have to do next? And to answer that question, I opened up the live deployed version of our application with all the final changes. It looks like somebody has been designing something, which is always exciting. And we can see that the primary difference from what we have in our work in progress and this one is the right sidebar. Uh, the left sidebar is the layers. Navbar allows you to add and remove the elements, while the right sidebar does a lot of exciting stuff. It allows you to change the size of specific elements simply by typing numbers. It also allows you to change different types of fonts. So you can go with Times New Roman or even Comic Sans if you're that crazy. You can also modify the colors of all the different elements like rectangles and even text elements. And let's test it out for a rectangle. There we go. That looks good. And we can also change the stroke to something like red. There we go. This is very crazy, but you can do it. That's the point. You can do absolutely everything you want within this Figma clone because it is yours. Not to mention that you can also export the canvas to PDF. That looks something like this. So we'll make all of this possible with our right sidebar. So I moved back to our application that's currently work in progress 
and I expanded it just barely so that we can see the right sidebar. And now we can get started working on it. To get started working on our sidebar, we can open up the page. And within the page, we can see that we're using this right sidebar without passing any additional props to it. Let's navigate to it and ask it what it needs. We can start from its JSX structure. We can modify some styles here since we just copied them from the left sidebar, such as change the left zero to right zero and remove the overflow Y auto and the padding bottom of 20. We won't be needing those. Now, then we have the H3 that has a padding X, padding top as well, text extra small and uppercase that says design. Right below that H3, we can create another span element. And here we can say something inspirational like make changes to canvas as you like. So we can literally make any changes right here. Let's also style this just a tiny bit by giving it a class name equal to text-xs for extra small, text-primary-gray-300, margin top of three, padding x of five, border b for bottom, border dash primary dash gray dash 200 and padding bottom of four. There we go. That's looking good. I also believe I'm a bit zoomed out. So I will keep it like that just so we can nicely see everything without taking too much space from our code. Or since we're just working on the right side, I can even expand the code right now and we can still see the sidebar on the right side. We can even expand it a bit so it looks a bit better. There we go. Now we can see everything. Below this span, we'll render different components that modify different aspects of our elements, such as a self-closing dimensions component coming from settings dimensions. Below dimensions, we can also render text, which is going to be for text modifications, which can be imported from settings text. Let's not forget the color modifications, which is going to be coming from settings colors. Then we can duplicate the color because we have one more for changing the stroke color. And finally, we have one for exporting the canvas as a PDF. So now if we save this, you'll see I'm guessing a lot of errors because some of the imports might not be correct. Although for you, there might, I'm going to fix them on my end. That's going to be coming from UI label. We have to install these two packages from ShadCN from the text. We have to fix the imports here as well. And we also have to install the select component. We'll do that soon. Let's just keep track of the chassis and components we have to install that select label input as well. What else do we have? Let's see in the color. We also get the label. We already have added that one to the list. And finally, we have the export where we have to install the button, which we already have and everything else is exactly as it should be. So let's close all of these components and let's install all of the chassis and components that we'll need to making our right sidebar possible. I'm going to open up the terminal. Just bring us back to the last command, which is going to be chassis and UI latest add. And now I'm going to add a select, a label and an input all at once by pressing enter. We'll explore all of these components in detail once we actually dive into each one of these components. Now, as soon as those get installed immediately on the right side, you should see something that looks like this. I even zoomed it in a bit so you can see it better. We have design, make changes to canvas as you like, the width, the height, the text, the font size, the font weight, and the ability to choose different background and stroke colors. Keep in mind that the majority of these are not functional yet. So if you just select a specific rectangle and then try to modify its values, you'll see that it won't do anything similar. Like if you try to change the font, you're going to get a lot of warnings and errors in this case. And if you try to select a color, you're going to also get a lot of errors. The reason why I'm showing this to you is to let you know that we will implement all the functionalities for all of the features in this sidebar together. What you can see right here is just the template, just the skeleton, just the UI that allows us to make all of this possible. So let's get started with the first one on our list from top to bottom, which is dimensions that allows us to change the width and the height properties 
of our elements on the screen. To make it work, we'll have to go back to our beloved page.dsx and believe it or not, add yet another ref to the list of our refs. We can call it const is editing ref, which is equal to the use ref. And at the start, we can make it null. Now we want to immediately use this ref in one of our listeners. So right here below where we have all of our canvas dot on, we're going to add an additional one called canvas dot on, and we're going to call it selection, specifically selection created. This is when a user selects the screen. There we get options, which can be any for now. And within it, we can call the handle canvas selection created. And to it, we can pass the options, the is editing ref, which we just created, as well as the set element attributes. And of course, we have to close this canvas properly so the app doesn't break. Now that we've fixed that, we can see that our handle canvas selection is complaining a bit about the is editing ref and set element attributes. To fix the is editing ref part, we have to see why the type is complaining. So if we go to the handle canvas selection created and then to its types right here by command clicking it, we can notice that it's not even accepting a type. So we can simply say is editing ref and that's going to be of a type react that mutable ref object of a type Boolean like this. The reason why we're creating this is editing ref is so that we can know if the user is manually editing a specific element. So now if we go back, it's going to complain, but now for a different reason, that's because we have to set it as a Boolean, not as a null. So if I go at the top, I can say false here at the start instead of a null. If we go here, you'll notice that now that's fine. It knows exactly what it is. But now we have to create this new function, set element attributes. And that's going to be a setter state. So right here at the top, we can create a new state field, use state, by using the use state snippet. We can call it element attributes and set element attributes like this at the start equal to an empty object, specifically an empty object with all of the empty properties, like width set to an empty string, height set to an empty string, font size also is going to be set to an empty string. We can do a font family, we can do font weight, we can also do a fill, which we can do something like AABBCC, I believe it's a gray color. And then we can also do a stroke of that similar color. And we can further explain the type. It's going to be called type attributes. There we go. So now we can set custom element attributes for each one of our elements. And we're passing that setter function into our listener on the selection created. Great. Now let's not forget we have to pass the is editing ref back to our right sidebar. So let's go right here and let's expand our right sidebar and pass it the element attributes, which is the new state we have created as well. The set element attributes. We can also pass it the fabric ref because we might need it to know what we're doing with the canvas as well as that is editing ref equal to is editing ref. We can also pass it the active object ref, just so we know on which object we're currently working on, as well as sync shape in storage, so that we can nicely sync it after making the change, like changing the color, we want to make sure that that change is synced to storage. With that said, we're now passing all of the right properties to our right sidebar, so we can go into it, and we can pass the necessary ones to our dimensions that will allow us to change the width and the height of our elements. First, we have to destructure the props we just passed. So let's get them right here at the top. We can get the element attributes. We also can get the set element attributes. Let's get the fabric ref next. We can get the active object ref. Let's also get the is editing ref. And finally, the sync shape in storage. Great. 
Don't forget, we also have to define the types for all of these. So we can say that's going to be of a type right sidebar props being imported from types. And in there, we also need to add that is editing ref of a type react dot mutable ref object of a type Boolean. Great. So now we can use all of those props. And before we use them, let's figure out exactly what we need to pass to our dimensions component. It's the width, the height, and the handle input change. Now, where do we get these from? Well, we can get the width and the height from here. Element attributes that width and height is going to be element attributes dot height. Now, when it comes to the handle input change, we can define it right here within our right sidebar. So we can say handle input change is equal to handle input change. And we can define it right here. Const handle input change is a function that accepts a property of a type string and a value of a type string as well. And based off of it, it can do something. Do you remember that is editing ref that we added just before? Well, here we can check if not is editing ref dot current, meaning if the not is manual editing is set to true, then we definitely want to set it to true. So we can say is editing ref dot current is set to true. So once again, let me explain what this means. We're going to have the automatic editing, which is this one where you drag and drop elements and move them around and scale them and do everything on the canvas. But then this editing ref checks out if you're editing elements manually through the fields. So then we need to turn it on to know how it should change those shapes. Once we know that we can then set element attributes, which is the state function we have created, get the previous attributes of that element, and then immediately return something with this structure. You wrap it in parentheses and then return an object. We want to spread all of the previous elements and then just update the specific property to that property value that we're changing. So for example, if we're changing the color, property will be color and value will be something like red. Finally, once we have updated the state, we also want to modify the shape. And to it, we need to pass the canvas, which is going to be fabric ref dot current as fabric. This is a state. And right now it's going to complain. That's because I haven't yet installed the types for our fabric. So if you quickly notice any kind of imports where importing fabric or anything like that, you'll see that it currently cannot find a declaration file for the types of fabric. So when using TypeScript, some great packages allow you to install additional development dependencies like the types for those packages. So in this case, we can copy this command and paste it within our terminal to install the types for fabric. And the second one is similar to this one, but it's types UUID. That's for the package we have previously installed. A lot of TypeScript documentation will be done automatically for us just for the reason that we're using these packages. Great. So now here we can say fabric dot canvas like this. And now we don't even have to import this because we have installed that dev package. The second thing we have to pass is the property that we're actually modifying, like the color, or in this case, the width and the height, the value we want to change the property to the active object ref that we're currently modifying and then sync shape in storage so that we know what to sync. And this is our handle input change that we are now passing to dimensions. So let's go into the dimensions and see exactly how it works. It looks like that it also wants us to pass the is editing ref. So while we're here, it's easy to do that. It's just is editing ref is equal to is editing ref. And now it's no longer complaining. So now if we go into it, Let's see exactly how it works. We have two different dimension options, label of W for width and label of H for height. Then we have a section with a div where we map over those options. And for each of these two options, we show a label, which is this letter right here. And then we also show the input. 
This input is what you can see right here. The most important thing is calling the input change, which is exactly what we have done right now together with this handle input change function. And then another important thing is calling the on blur functionality. On blur handler or listener is triggered once you exit out of the input. So right now it's not blurred, it's active, but as soon as you click outside, the on blur activates. And that way we can know to stop the manual editing, turn it to false and get back to automatic editing that's gonna allow us to resize the elements like this. Great. So with that in mind, the dimensions file is completely done. TypeScript is no longer complaining, which means that it should be working. So let's give it a spin. I'm going to put this in the center and I will try to change the width of this image. Let me make it something like 500. There we go, that's a bit stretched out. And let me change this to 400. There we go, that works, that's great. It's a bit tricky with these images because you cannot know how to keep the correct aspect ratio on different pixel sizes. But what you can do is automatically resize it by holding the corners and then moving it like this. That way it keeps its original aspect ratio. But something is a bit weird right here. You notice that the values remained exactly as they were, 500 and 400. And only if we click on it, they're gonna update. How can we make it so that they update in real time as we are resizing? Let me show you. If we go back to the page and scroll down to where we have all of our listeners, which is right here, mouse down, mouse move, mouse up, object modified, selection created, and even resize, below selection created, we wanna create a new one called canvas.on. And here we wanna look into the object scaling. So once we scale the object, as before, we get the options, we open up the function block, and in this one, we'll call the handle canvas object scaling. And to it, we're gonna pass the options as well as set element attributes. Why are we passing the set element attributes? Well, that's because it will allow us to modify the width and the height of those elements. So now if we collapse this and go back, it looks like we have to properly close it by giving it one more parenthesis. And if we go back, I'm gonna bring it back to 500 and 400, and I will try to automatically resize it. Check this out. It updates in real time and you know exactly where it will be. So if I wanted to do 300, I can do exactly that and notice how it kept its aspect ratio. Great. Now, modifying text elements is a bit different. Sure, you can scale them up as you would with any other elements, and you can also stretch them, which you definitely don't wanna do. And that's exactly why for text elements, we're gonna focus on a completely new set of tools. You'll be able to change the font family, font size, and the font weight. So to get started with that, let's move to our right sidebar and let's focus on the text element. Similarly, as to our dimensions, we had to pass the width and the height from the element attributes. To our text, we'll have to pass the font family. And once again, you might be wondering where will that come from? Well, it's coming from the element attributes. So we can say element attributes dot font family. Similarly, we wanna get the font size and the font weight as well. And the last thing, is that handle input change, which will be exactly the same as it was on the dimensions. The element attributes store everything that element could have, like color two, we'll see that soon. And then this handle input change, the way we developed it is agnostic to which properties it is changing, meaning that it can do colors, texts, as well as sizes. So let's see exactly how text works. It accepts all of these properties, and then it renders a select field. This select field we can find right here at the bottom. And it's basically nothing more than a select that chooses which select to show. Is it a font size or is it a font weight? Once we choose it, we have its content and the trigger to be able to choose from different options. That's basically it. Now let's see what else do we have besides this select. So we render the select. 
we do it for the font size, weight, and family, and pass the appropriate handle input change to it, which then changes all of these properties within the attributes of that specific element. So let's give it a spin. So let's try to modify this text a bit by clicking on it and then choosing a different font like Times New Roman, Comic Sans, or the brush script. There we go. This one is really specific. I'm going to keep it at Helvetica. Then you can choose a font size. We can go to something smaller like 28 or 36. Finally, you can also change the weight. You'll notice that some fonts do not support different weights like Helvetica in this case, but you can go full bold on it and that works without any trouble. That's basically it. All there is to it to modifying your text fields. With that said, let me bring this back and let's focus on the color. Color is interesting because by using color, we can modify both the text fields as well as the rectangles and other shapes. So let's pass all the necessary ones to our first color picker right here, such as the input ref, which corresponds to color input ref. And this is a new ref, which we'll create right within the right sidebar because this is the only place where we use it. So we can say const, color input ref is equal to use ref at the start equal to null. And don't forget to import use ref as this is the first time we're using it in this file. We can also duplicate this below and do another one for the stroke input ref. Stroke is like a border. It happens outside of the element. So for the first one, we're passing the color input ref. Then we can pass the attribute that we wanted to change which in this case, it is element attributes dot fill. We also want to modify the placeholder, which is going to be the color and the handle input change, which is equal to handle input change. Let's also not forget about the attribute type that has to be set to fill because this one is changing the fill and we can duplicate it right below. The second one won't be changing the fill rather it will be changing the stroke. So here we can say stroke element attributes that stroke placeholder also stroke. And also this is going to be a stroke input ref. There we go. So now we have those two pickers right here and they look great. Now let's see exactly how they behave. If we go into here, you'll notice that we're getting all of these fields. And then we have an input property that allows us to choose or enter a specific color. Believe it or not, this is a built in HTML5 color input, no additional packages. The only thing you have to do to make it happen and to turn it from a regular input like this one right here is to add a type of color and you have a built in RGB color picker. Great. Now, if we select a specific element and if we try to modify the color, you can see that it works like a charm. Let's try to go with this bluish variant that matches our design. So I'm going to go right here and go for a bit of a bluer one. There we go. That's more like it. Let's also try changing the stroke. We can go to a lighter color. There we go. That's looking great. I hope you can see it. If you want to, you can also implement the opacity. For now, I didn't go that far. So I simply left it at 90%. And this is it. This is how you change the color and the stroke of a text field. But what we can do is also modify the color and the stroke of a rectangle or any other shape. So you can go here and you can select it and then modify its color like this. And you can also modify the stroke. There we go. That's more like it. Pretty cool stuff, right? And it is so simple to make once you look into this. I know you didn't code out this component, but it's nothing more than a div with an H3, a couple of inputs, and labels. That's all that it is. And we can also remove this 90% as it's just static code. So this way we don't even see it. Great. With that said, the last thing we have to do right here is the export. So let's go into the export component and see how it works. The only thing that this does is it has a button with an on click that it calls the utility function called export to BDF. And the only thing that that function does is it takes the canvas by selecting it with a query selector. Then it turns it into a PNG image. 
of the same size of the canvas width and height, and then saves it at a PDF. So let's test it out. If we go right here and try to save this, I'm gonna click export to PDF, and we get an error. This error is saying that the doc is not defined. So if we go back to utils, we can see that the doc indeed is not defined. And that's because before, to show you how this truly works, I commented out this part. So let's bring it back. What powers this PDF download is the JS PDF library, which we can also import right here at the top coming from JS PDF. A simple Google search will point you to a JS PDF NPM page where you can see that it has 1.1 million weekly downloads. And basically the only thing it does is it prints a document. So let's install it by running npm install JS PDF. After that, this red squiggly line should be gone. And with it, we should now have access to this doc right here. So if we go back and try to export to PDF, this time it actually does it. And if you open it up, it's gonna look something like this. I didn't go as far as changing the background color of this document. You could change it to match your canvas, but already this is a good starting point for you to start adding more features if you want to. With that said, we can close all of these files and believe it or not, we're completely done with the right sidebar. So now let's expand this to see it in its full glory. And on my other screen, I'm just testing it as well by saying something like test right here, sending some emojis, or even collaborating live on the document. So all of the stuff that we explored previously still works. And since you have the same privileges as your friend, you can now just delete those elements as well and they get removed from the layers. And the last thing we can focus on are LiveBlocks comments. They're currently in beta and they allow discussions on your whiteboard or, or any kind of website effortlessly. Essentially, you can just click it, leave a comment, and everybody can have a discussion on whether that feature or design is good or not. It works within the text editor, but in this case, we're more interested in doing it within a whiteboard-like interface or within a full Figma redesign. So you can do exactly what you need as it's flexible and you can attach it to a specific point on your canvas, which is exactly what we'll do today. So let's navigate over to LiveBlocks comments documentation page and just start following the steps. First, we have to install it. We have already installed the client and the React, so we simply need to install the LiveBlocks React comments. Going back to our code, we can say npm install and then add LiveBlocks forward slash React dash comments. The second step right here is to initialize the LiveBlocks config, which we have already done, create the LiveBlocks client, which we have already done, join a room that is done as well, and then add LiveBlocks room to our page. We have done that. And here we dive into adding comments. They use the use threads hook to get the threads in the room and then use the thread component to render them. Finally, they add a way to create threads by adding a composer. So we can use their example right here by copying this entire piece of code. Within our application, we can go to our components and then comments and create a new file called comments overlay.tsx. Within it, we can paste what we copied. Of course, make sure to fix the LiveBlocks config path, which will be coming from add forward slash LiveBlocks config, and then we need the composer and the thread. Now that we've done this, let's see if there's something else we have to do within our docs. And there is, and that is adding the styles to our globals.css. So we can copy that, collapse this, and go to globals.css. And you'll notice that I already added this at the start for you. So you don't have to worry about that at all. With that said, we can proceed with creating our comments. And the first question is, within where are we gonna use this comments overlay? It's gonna be within a special component called comments. So we can create a new component called comments.tsx, inside of which you can run RAFCE. We can make it into an export const, not export default. And within here, you'll need to use a special property coming from LiveBlocks. 
and that is client side suspense coming from Liveblock's React. This allows our comments to be rendered on the client side, and don't forget to pass it a fallback, which for now we can simply set to null. Within this client suspense, we can specify a new dynamic block of code and then render the automatic return of the comments overlay that we have created just before, and we can import it right here. And now the question is, where can we call this comments component? Well, we're gonna call it within our live component. Right here where we have the cursors and everything else, we can simply show the comments. Because the comments themselves aren't anything, they're an overlay that appears on top of different things. So we can simply import them right here. If you do that and go back to your app, maybe just spread it up a bit, you'll be able to see something that looks like this. Write a comment. And you can start writing and then create it. That's because the LiveBlocks team within our comments overlay already provided a composer. But we want to hide that for now because we're going to show it only on a specific click once we actually know where we want to place that comment. So let's figure out within where are we going to use that composer. We already created a skeleton for one component called new thread that for now simply returns children, nothing else. And we briefly used it within our navbar. If you remember, if we select a comment, then we trigger the new thread component where we have the button and then everything else within it. But the new thread right now is completely empty. So let's focus on the new thread so we can first add a thread and then we can focus on displaying them. And if you came this far into the video, then you already must be a pro. So I went ahead and prepared the complete new thread component for you and documented it well with a lot of comments. So in the readme down below, you can find it and paste it right here. You'll notice it's a lengthy one, but the majority of the code right here is actually comments. So I would suggest maybe pausing the video a bit and going over it and trying to understand exactly what it does. But don't forget, I'm here to go over it with you as well. And before I go ahead and explain it, you might notice that we also need two additional components for the new thread to work, the pin composer and the new thread cursor. So create a new file within comments called pinned composer.tsx. And you can find the code in the readme down below. Finally, the last one is the new thread cursor.tsx. And you can also paste that right here. Now, if you go back, you'll notice that it's still complaining about the pin composer. And let's see why it cannot get it. It's pinned composer. I think that's how we named it. Yep, that looks good. And if we look at the export here, export pinned composer. That's looking good. It looks like as soon as I removed it and just automatically imported it once again by clicking here, even though it's the same path, it's no longer complaining and it works. So now let me go ahead and explain exactly how this new thread works. We start off with tracking whether we have placed or not placed the new comment yet. So we have three different states, placing, placed, or complete. And it's really cool that we can make some kind of an enum with TypeScript like this. So we know exactly that this creating comment can be only one of those three states. Then we're using the use create thread hook to create a new thread coming directly from LiveBlocks. And here I left for you a documentation page. It simply exposes the mutation to create a thread. Then this is a special function that I have created called use max Z index that returns the highest Z index of all threads. That way we can always show it on top. We store it in a variable right here. Then we set state to track the coordinates of the composer, which is the live blocks comment editor. We also need to know where on the screen are we showing it. We then set state to track the last pointer event. We'll use this later on, you'll see why. We also need to set additional states to track if the user is allowed to use the composer, such as only when the composer editor is actually opened and clicked. If it's not opened and expanded, there's no input that we can type in. So that's why we need to track that state. We also have the ref 
to connect it to that composer. Within this use effect, we figure out if the composer is already placed. And keep in mind, composer, again, uh, may be a complicated word, but it's basically an editor to create and edit comments. So if it's already placed, don't do anything. Otherwise, once we click, place the composer on the screen with this new comment function. And if it's already placed, click outside to close it. And if it's not placed, once you first click on it, it sets it down. Again, it's all gonna make much more sense once you see it in action. As a matter of fact, let me show you how that works on the finished website. I'm gonna go right here, select a comment, and click on it right here. This window right here is called a composer. And here, you can do all sorts of things. It has some simple styling capabilities, like you can make text bolded, you can also make it italic, and so on, which is pretty cool. You can also add emojis and even mention some people by name, of course, if you implemented authentication into this app. Definitely something we could explore in the next one if you like this video. So that's our composer. So now let me proceed with explaining it further. Here, we add an event listener so we can listen for clicks on that new comment. And this changes only when the creating comment state changes. The second use effect is for dragging the composer. So here, we're tracking the pointer move and modifying the coordinates of the comment. And this one just ensures that the comment is placed exactly where the cursor is. You can see that by these listeners. So we're looking for the pointer down or even for the context menu, because from the context menu, which we'll implement soon, you can also choose to add a comment. Now, finally, on composer submit is a function that creates the thread and resets all the states. Now, this part right here is very important. If you just get the current X and Y positions, it's gonna get it relative to the entire window of the browser. But keep in mind, we're working within a tiny portion of that window, which is the canvas. We don't want the left sidebar, the right sidebar, or the nav bar to mess up with their positioning. That's why we use the get bounding client rect which only gets the positioning from the div you're within, in this case, our canvas, and then we can properly calculate the position where we wanna create that thread. And this is the function that does it. We pass it the body and the metadata, which contains the X and Y positions. Resolve is set to false because nobody has yet seen it. And we increase the Z index to plus one. We do some quick cleanup by setting the creating comment state to complete, resetting coordinates, and setting the allow use composer to false. With that said, we return this slot right here. And slot is used to wrap the children of the new thread component and allows us to add a click event listener to the children. A bit of a complicated explanation, but Radix documentation dives a bit deeper. In simple words, it merges its props onto its immediate child. Essentially, the slot component is a utility component that doesn't render any DOM element itself, but it clones its children and then feeds them with the prop that you pass into the slot. That way, you can attach different click handlers to children without knowing what kind of element they are. Very interesting component, I know, but essentially, it attaches the on click and the style to whatever children we pass right here. Finally, if we have the composer coordinates, then we render the composer. That looks something like this. A portal is a way to render children into a DOM node that exists outside of the DOM hierarchy of the parent component. So basically, it stands on its own away from the navbar. The way we typically use portals is to render components outside of their parent component. In this case, we want to be able to do comments anywhere on the screen. And this button right here is within the navbar. But you're not going to leave a new comment within the navbar. You're going to leave it somewhere else, which is exactly what we portal out of the navbar into the canvas. And then within it, we display a pin composer, which is nothing more than a simple div containing the comment image and then the famous composer component coming directly from LiveBlocks, allowing you to create a new comment.
And that, my friends, is the new thread component. Here, you also have a new thread cursor, which is basically once you place your current cursor on that comment, it basically just displays a different version of the comment so you know you're hovering over it. Okay, a lot of talking. Let's see what we have in our code. If we now go back right here and maybe even make it a bit larger, we can now click on this comment. And would you look at that? It appears like we're adding a comment. Let's try to click on this ultimate next 14 and we can try writing something. Let's say make it ultimate next 14 course and press enter. With that, a new comment will get added, but it does seem like it kind of went away. It's so hard to see it. Even if we zoom out, it looks like it's not even on the screen. So let's figure out what's up with that. We have implemented the ability to add the comments right now. But if we go back to the comments overlay, you can see how we're displaying them. We're simply mapping over them, but we have no idea where they will show up. So let's just first console log the comments to see if we really created them. So if I go here and inspect within the console, we can see that we have two comments right here and they're being preloaded quite often. Later on, we'll memoize our components and this issue will be fixed. But the most important part for right now is that we have those two comments we created and we should be able to see the metadata. Yep, this is great. We're storing the exact coordinates of where we want to place them. And you can see the comments within that thread. There we go. Now, the reason why they're not showing up is quite obvious. We are not attaching the X and Y axes to them. That means that they have no idea where to go. So to fix it, what we have to do is create a modified version of the thread component provided by LiveBlocks while still using it, but call it a pinned thread. That pinned thread will behave like a pin that you put on a board. It's going to stay exactly where you created. So the complete comments overlay code is in the readme down below. So you can simply copy it and paste it here. And you'll also notice that it uses this special pinned thread component as well. So let's create it right here by creating a new pinned thread dot TSX. And you can also copy it from the readme and paste it right here. Now that you've done that, let's go ahead and analyze what are we doing differently with our comments overlay. We're still using the use threads hook, which is the one that gives us access to these comments. We introduce the max Z index to know where to display them. We map over them and then we call the overlay thread instead of a simple thread provided by LiveBlocks. This overlay thread allows us to edit the metadata and we also get the loading once the user uses or consumes that thread. We create a ref for it because we have to keep track of that element to be able to know where to position it. We increase the Z index and add it to the metadata so that we know once we create a new comment, it should go on top of it. And finally, we return a div that renders the pin thread. And the pin thread is nothing more than the original thread coming from LiveBlocks, but we have wrapped it with a couple of divs to make sure that it shows exactly where it should show on the screen on correct X and Y coordinates. And would you look at that? I have added two comments, one while I was testing and another real one, make it ultimate next 14 course. In the current version, we cannot move these around. That's something that you could explore implementing as well. But let's go ahead and try to create another one. Maybe we can say something like, change this color to purple and press enter. It gets added, but you can notice that it shifted just a tiny bit. One thing we can do is also close these threads or resolve them just by clicking on them. So let's try to do one more for changing the color. I'm going to place it here, change color to purple. And you can see it kind of moves a bit to the top left. And you can also add the emoji, but it's going to appear after you reopen the comment. We can look into that later. And we also have to look into these emojis right here. These are for reactions. But when you're actually chatting, if you try to select an emoji right now, it doesn't do anything. 
So that's something we also have to look into. Now, most of the bugs that you've seen on my end right now shouldn't have existed at all for you. For you, everything should have worked the first time. That's because I just recently updated the new thread component, which I provided to you at the start. And in there, I added a couple of these fixes for the positioning of the thread, as well as closing and opening it. So if we go to line 175 and 6, you can notice that I just made a change to look into the composer chords, which are relative to our current canvas. So that's a much more precise position. And also, if we go right here, you'll notice that we're now properly closing and opening the composer if we click on it. And the other file where we made some changes is within the pin thread, which you also had access to. Specifically, right here, we added an if statement checking if we click on a specific icon, such as emojis or anything else, then we exit out of the function and not minimize the window. That's why we weren't able to select emojis before. So now, if we try to add a new comment with those changes right here on the orange part, and I say something like test and press enter, you can see that it still brings it a bit up. Let's figure out why that is. Also, we have to fix those scroll bars on right side and at the bottom. We'll do that very soon. But first, let's fix the positioning. I believe we can fix that by modifying the classes within the live component. These ones right here. We are never setting the relative positioning, and that is very important. We have to say relative. We can give it a full height by saying h-full instead of 100vh. We also can give it a flex. We can also give it a flex one, so it expands the full width however much it can. We are also giving it a full width, item center, justify center, and we don't need text center. That was before when we were just playing with the live blocks features. So now if I remove the text center and save it and reload the canvas, you can see that now the comment is exactly where we placed it. That is looking good. Usually if you had real users here, you would be able to see their profile photo and also their name. The way you close the comment is you just click on it. Great. And as soon as we implement these class names, you can also see that no longer can we see those scroll bars on the right. So that has been fixed as well. Now let's look into the emoji issues. So for example, I'm going to say something like, let's do this one right here. MongoDB is great. By the way, notice that we still have those bars. I was wrong. We'll fix them. So I'm going to press enter. We have our comment anonymous and let's try to emote to it. So we can put a reaction, which when you reopen, you can see the reaction here. And you can also reply and say something like, yep, it is. And you can also tag people if you had real users. And you can also add emojis to comments as well and press enter. All of that works in real time. And of course, if another user had this opened, they would be able to see it too. Let's try to replicate the situation where we have those scroll bars. I think if we do this, yep, they're going to appear. And now we can navigate to globals.css and we can try to target the body element and simply do something like overflow and then hidden because we cannot scroll through our canvas. And as soon as we do that, the issue is fixed. But of course, many of these issues that we're experiencing are here only because we're working on such a small screen. But as soon as we expand it, you can see the right sidebar and it looks so much better. And of course, you're not going to have many of these issues that we experienced. But hey, it's good that we handled the edge cases too. So with that in mind, the comments work. We can say great. We can add emojis. We can do all sorts of different things. And they're actually being placed exactly where we need them. So with that said, you have successfully implemented the ability to add all kinds of different elements text elements as well, delete them, reset them, add overlay comments, keep track of the layer history, as well as modify everything there is to modify about elements like their colors, strokes, font families, and the width and the height. So what do we have to do next? The next thing we can focus on is the menu. Now the menu right here, when I click, it allows me to save the image, copy, help or inspect. But on the deployed version, once I click, I have these special options that I can do. For example, even if I don't know that I can press the forward slash to chat, 
I can right click and then see all the options like chat, undo, redo, and even reactions. So let's go ahead and implement that using the chat CN menu. Specifically, we'll be using chat CN's context menu. It allows us to display a menu to the user, such as a set of actions or functions triggered by a button, exactly what we need. The installation is simple. We just have to run MPX chat CN UI latest add context menu. So let's simply paste it to one of our empty terminals. It's going to install it. And then here is the usage. We can first import all of the imports necessary to make the menu. We can go back to live and just use them right at the top of this page. Then we can copy its usage and we can scroll all the way down to the JSX portion of our live.tsx. The only thing we have to do is wrap everything we have into a context menu. So we can do it right here, which will temporarily break our application, but we'll soon fix it. So in this case, we have the context menu, which needs to wrap absolutely everything. So let's first copy the rest and keep the context menu on top. And of course, we need to close it right here at the end. That is the primary wrapper for our menu. The second thing we need to do is say where the context menu trigger will be. And in this case, our entire div or the canvas is actually a context menu trigger. So we can replace this div to context menu trigger like this. And of course, we have to close that context menu trigger at the bottom. There we go. And the next thing we have to do is scroll all the way down. That's going to be right here. And we want to close the context menu trigger. And then after it, still within the context menu, render the context menu content like this. We can give it a class name equal to write dash menu dash content. And I think this is enough for us to get back to our application. There we go. Not much to see, but we can start playing with it. If you right click, you'll be able to see an empty menu. So now let's start adding the menu content. Right here, we can map over our shortcuts coming from constants by saying shortcuts.map, where we get each individual shortcut item. And then for each one, we return a context menu item, like so. Within the context menu item, we can simply return a p tag that's going to render the item.name. And of course, each item in a map has to have a key. So we can say item.key will be the key. Great. Now let's first dive into the shortcuts to see what they are. This is simply an array of predefined objects. One is to chat, two is to undo, three redo, and four reactions. So now if we go here and right click, you can see all of these elements on which you'll soon be able to click to activate them. And we can also render the shortcut right here by rendering a P tag with a class name equal to text XS text dash primary dash gray dash 300. And there we can render the item dot shortcut. If you save it and right click, you can now see some reactions. Of course, it's not so well styled. And right now you can just do that reaction by clicking it, but you cannot yet click on the actual item to activate it. So to make that happen, we can give the context menu item an on click property which will handle the context menu click. And then to it, we can pass the item dot name. Of course, this is the function that we are yet to create. So if we scroll a bit up, we can create a new const handle context menu click. That will be a use callback hook coming from react. And it will accept a key of an action that we want to click of a type string and then we can return the actual function. Since we're using the use callback, we also need to pass the dependency array. The use callback is used when you want to memoize the version of the callback that only changes if one of the inputs has changed. So if you click on one of these items for the first time, for example, the chat, it will call this function. But the second time that you call it the same one, it's not going to recompute the values because the input hasn't changed. So we're just making our app more optimized. Right here, we can call a switch statement that's going to look into the key. And then the case is chat with a capital C. 
Then we want to call the set cursor state. And to it, we can pass the mode cursor chat dot chat, previous message is null, and message is equal to an empty string, and then we want to break it. Now let's test it out. If I go back, we'll see too many re renders. I think that's because if we scroll down, you'll notice that I immediately use this function. And it's even complaining right here. You never want to call function like this, because as the code is being interpreted, it's going to start reading on click, and then it will start reading handle context menu click. And hey, this is a function call. So let me call this function immediately and not on the on click. So to remove this error, we simply have to put it in a callback function, which is going to look something like this, open parentheses, and then a function call. Now we won't have too many re renders, it's only going to call it once we click. There we go. Now let's go back and let's add other pieces off or switch, should I say the second one will be case undo. Again, make sure to use a capital first letter. In that case, we simply want to call the undo function, which is coming from live blocks hook. Remember, we used it before as well. So just so we don't have to recall the hook, we can also just pass it into the live as a prop. So if we scroll all the way up, you'll notice that we're not passing those as props right now. Let's see where we're calling the live component. We're calling it within the page. And you can see that we're not passing anything to it. But what we can pass is the undo equal to undo, as well as redo is equal to redo. Now, if we go back to live, we can tell our props that we are expecting it. So we can say undo and redo. And to the props, we can say that undo is of a type function that returns void, meaning nothing. And redo is also a function that returns void. Now, if we go back to our switch statement, we can say undo, call the undo function. And don't forget to break it because we're not returning. And of course, on case redo, we do redo and then break. And that's about it. Now, finally, let's just style this context menu item by giving it a class name equal to write dash menu dash item, save it. And now if we right click, you'll see that it looks great. You can immediately stop the right menu by clicking out and use the keyboard shortcut, for example, forward slash, or you can also just click on it to activate it. So for example, let's say that you like to use your mouse more than your keyboard, and you want to create a new element. Oh, for some reason, it doesn't want to create any elements on my end. Let me reload the canvas. Oh, there we go. Now it's good. So let's say you want to create a rectangle. And then let's say that you change the color of this rectangle to something like blue as well. And maybe bring it back to green. But then say, hey, I like the blue one better, it matched our design more. So then you go here and click undo. And you can also bring it back to green. Great. Also, there's reactions, which don't seem to open right now. But when I click the letter E, they do open. So let's see what that's about. I think I forgot to add the switch case for reactions. That's why it's not working. So right here, we can say case is reactions, make sure to spell it exactly like this. And then we can set the cursor state to mode cursor mode that reaction selector, and then break it. Now, if we right click and click reactions, they show up. Great. That is it for the menu. That part is working now as well. And as we're approaching the end of this amazing build, let's try to remember if we still have some little bugs or some issues that we have yet to fix. I think one of these is our free drawing. Although it technically works, it's not being stored or saved anywhere and it will not show on other person's screen. Why is that? Well, you can create it, you can move it around, but you get errors, you cannot drop it, and you cannot even delete it. And if you reload the page, you'll notice that it's no longer there. So let's fix our app to also work with freeform drawing. To fix our freeform, we have to go back to our page.tsx. And there we have to add an additional listener. We have to add a canvas dot on 
path created. So let's duplicate this listener right here below, collapse it, and just modify it to path created. Then we can call a special function handle path created coming from lib canvas. So make sure to import it. And let's see what do we need to pass to it. We need to pass the options as well as sync shape in storage. And the only thing it does is it gets the path object and then sets unique ID to that path and then syncs it in storage. It is as simple as that. So let's pass sync shape in storage. And with that, we should be good. So let's give it a go. I'm going to go to our shapes, choose free drawing and try to draw something right here on our canvas. There we go. This seems like a Picasso, so it should be good. Now, if I select it and if I try moving it around, that also works. And the main question is, will it sync into other person's device? So the first way to test it is let's reload our screen and it's there. And the second way to test it is to check it out on another browser. So if I open up Freeform and continue drawing right here, you can see that it actually works, but it waits until the shape is completed. There we go. That's interesting. Now we can also delete all of the individual shapes. So if we click right here, we can delete them. There we go. So as we're wrapping up, I remember that I promised that we're going to fix a couple of TypeScript any types uh, to make it a real proper TypeScript application. So let's start from our live.tsx file. Right here at the top, we don't have to import the type for the reaction event. What we can do instead is just simply remove it from where we used it, reaction event, and just remove it. It should be automatically understood by live blocks. But you can see that these errors are still there. Property value does not exist on type room event. Well, another thing we can do here is where we use this cursor, we also set as any. We don't want to do that. We can simply remove it and make it so that live blocks automatically defines the types. But for this to work, we also have to go into our types. So let's navigate to types.ts and let's see where we're modifying the presence. So here, because I wanted to make some quick fixes, I put any, but we don't really need that. We don't need to import presence or even use it within a live cursor props. All of that will work automatically by live blocks automatic types. So now to make our cursor aware of its existence on the presence, we need to go to live blocks config.ts specifically right here where we define the presence. They already created a special type for us that we can modify. So we can say export type presence, and we can say cursor X and Y coordinates, and we can also make it have a message. This way you craft your own types like this. So now that should help a bit. And right in here as well, we can import that reaction, import reaction event that we had from types. And then we can also export it right from the live blocks config type room event is equal to reaction event. There we go. And now if you go back, you can see that it's no longer complaining and we know exactly what this cursor is. Sometimes you have to go through a bit of docs to figure out exactly how to use TypeScript types for a specific package. It's going to save you in the long run. Also, I noticed that we're doing some props drilling here by calling the use others on top of live but we're not using it anywhere within the live. So let's simply delete it from here, delete the import as well, and then delete where we're passing it into the other component. We can simply call it within the live cursors. It's much cleaner. So right here, instead of just passing the others through props, what we can do is just import and use others. So const others is equal to use others coming from live blocks config. And I don't believe we have to put it within curly braces. So that's now good. Also, this message could potentially be null now. So we can say or empty string, which will fix this error. TypeScript is a beautiful beast once you learn how to tame it. But if you don't, it's just going to annoy you. So it's better to invest some time beforehand and then use all of the benefits that it provides and stands by your side. So with that said, we've made our app even better by cleaning some of the TypeScript anys. 
And check this out. If you're having some issues inspecting the collaborative experiences you're implementing, there's also this crazy developer extension that you can add to your browser. There's a cool video that shows you exactly how you can use it, but in a nutshell, it gets added directly to your browser's developer tools, and you can monitor all the collaborative experiences instead of just the components, console logs, and elements. Pretty cool stuff. So you can quickly install it by going to adding to Chrome. Just add it to your browser. And once you do that, it will be directly within your developer tools. So if you open it up, you'll be able to see live blocks right here. And here you can see all of the canvas object. In this case, that is a live map. So what we can do is I'm gonna clear our terminal and you can see that the live map is completely empty. You can also see inside of which room you are and what is in the storage. You can track the presence, cursor, cursor color, and more. So what would happen if another user joins? I'm going to put this to the side and bring another user in. And immediately you can see in developer tools that now we can see two other people. We can see me and we can see other. That works very well. You can also track their cursor positions, cursor colors, and more. And if we add an element right here, such as rectangle, you can see that it also immediately appears under canvas objects. Incredible way to just debug what's happening, track events, presence, and just in general, improve our collaborative experiences. Now with that said, let's get our app live on the internet. Deploying it won't be as easy as putting it on Vercel. There's one extra step we have to do. And that's because Next.js will try to render our canvas on the server side, which can never work. Canvas has to work within the browser. So for that, we have to skip SSR. And the way to do it is to just wrap everything in a component C and then set SSR option to false. So let me show you how to do that. We can first take absolutely everything we have within our page.tsx. So simply select everything by saying Command or Control A and then Command or Control C to copy it. Delete everything from here. Yeah, it's scary, I know, but just do it. And create a new app.tsx file within the app and then paste everything there. Once you do that, we'll do a little trick within the page.tsx. There, we'll copy what Next.js suggests us to do. And that is const app is equal dynamic imported from next dynamic and then callback function with the import of, in this case, our dot slash app. And then we simply turn the SSR to false. This is how you do it. Now our entire application will be rendered on the client side and we can simply say export default app. So let's give it a spin. If we go back, everything works exactly like it did before, but now once we deploy it, we won't have any issues with the client side server side rendering. With that in mind, let's create a new GitHub repo and push our code to it. You can go to github.com forward slash new and create a new repo with a name of something like liveblocks figma clone. I think that'll be good. And you can create a repo. Then simply follow the commands by opening the terminal, stopping it from running. We can also delete one and say git init, git add dot, git commit dash m initial commit. Then you wanna modify the branch to main, add a remote origin, and finally push u origin main. If you do that and reload, you'll be able to see all of your code you worked so hard on right here on a public GitHub repo. After that, you can go to vercel.com, just create an account or log in, and you'll be able to see all of your projects on the dashboard. We have many projects so far. Most of these belong to some of our YouTube videos, like this one, which will come soon, and this 3D portfolio you've seen some time ago. We definitely need to do another 3D project. There's also many projects belonging to our masterclass, which is the official JavaScript mastery bootcamp program that helps you advance to mid and senior positions. 
So if you're interested in joining, just go to jsmastery.pro and check it out. With that in mind, look at this. There is a little issue right here with the overflow on the Vercel's card. We should definitely let them know about that. With that in mind, we can click add new, add a new project, and Vercel should be smart enough to automatically see your new project and click import. In this case, we do have one environment variable. So go back to your code, go to .env.local, copy everything and simply paste it right here. That's gonna add the next public liveblocks public key and click deploy. This process usually takes about a minute, so let's give it some time and I'll be right back. And of course, we cannot expect that the deployment process of such a long, complicated and exciting project will just work. So we do have a build error right here and it looks like it's pointing to the canvas node, specifically referencing the loaders belonging to Webpack. It looks like we need an appropriate loader to handle this file type. So going back to our code, we can navigate to next.config.mjs and we need to add a proper Webpack configuration to render Canvas. We can do that by at the top saying Webpack, getting its config from the callback function and then specifying utf-8 dash validate of common JS space utf-8 dash validate. There we go. We also need something known as a buffer util, which is gonna be a common JS buffer util. Let's make sure to properly enclose this in double quoted strings. And finally, we also need a canvas of a type common JS canvas. Now we need to not just make this an object or a function block, we need to return an object. So let's wrap this in parentheses. There we go. And then now it will look good without any errors. And finally, return this modified config. Of course, we're just returning the same config right here, but what we need to do instead is say config.externals.push. And then we do what we have done here. So I've been a mistake. We don't wanna enclose it here, rather we enclose it right here within this push. So that's gonna look like this. You close it. And once we update the externals of the config, then we return it. And now our application should be capable of rendering a canvas. And just in case we have some TypeScript errors, right here below images, we can say TypeScript and we can add ignore build errors, which is gonna be set to true, just in case we have a tiny error, so it still lets us pass. With that in mind, you can say git add dot git commit dash m and say modify config and then git push. This will try to automatically redeploy our project. So no need to try it manually again. Just go back to your projects, open up the project, go to deployments, and you'll see that it's automatically building it. And as you can see, our website has been deployed. You can go to project and then click visit. If you reload, you'll see a great loading, which is almost instantaneous. It just works right off the bat and you can start creating additional elements and layouts as if you were in a real Figma. I'm not a great designer, but yeah, you can definitely do some great stuff here. You can also see that this collaboration works immediately because there's another cursor here, although it looks like they are away from keyboard. There's a third one right here as well. It looks like somebody leaked my deployed URL. So let's see if it speaks. Hi there, stranger. No, looks like it's a bit shy. Doesn't matter. This is it. Our LiveBlocks application is now fully complete. Everything works from resizing in real time, modifying the elements, changing the colors as well. Everything works so seamlessly and you can see it just work. You can also export to PDF, which is great. You can create additional elements. All of that works in real time and all of that works within your Thick Pro application. With that said, huge thanks to LiveBlocks, not only for sponsoring this video, but for building such a phenomenal piece of software that allows us to create these collaborative experiences. And if you reach the end of this video, 
you truly are the perfect fit for our ultimate Next.js 14 course. The course that you just watched, Building This Canvas, it's great and it does use Next.js, but it doesn't really dive into depth about all of these cool Next.js features that make it what it is, such as the hydration error resolving, caching, edge versus node runtimes, global state management, client versus server data fetching, and just ensuring that your app works properly. We do that within this course. So we have deep dive with very detailed lessons, build and deploy a complex app, and even active lessons within which you can test your knowledge. Not to mention that you'll build one of the best developer apps out there, which is a modern Stack Overflow clone. With that said, thank you so much for being with me of building our Figma clone application and have a wonderful day.